Good evening, everyone. It's good to be back in person. Um, the regular business meeting of the Independent School District 279 School Board is called to order at 6.01 p.m. on January 26, 2021. This regular business meeting of the Osseo School Board is being conducted in person and in compliance with Minnesota Statute 13D.01. However, due to the current pandemic and consist consistent with directives of the CDC and applicable executive orders, it is not feasible con to conduct this meeting in person without restricting the number of persons in attendance. Consistent with current health guidance and applicable executive orders, up to nine members of the community are able to be present in the boardroom with us tonight, and space has been made for an additional 15 persons to attend on-site in the nearby cafeteria. Consistent with executive order, a face covering is required to be worn during the meeting, but may be temporarily removed when speaking. Seated in front of you this evening from my left and your right, Director Tamara Grady, Director Thomas Brooks, Director Jackie Mosqueda Jones, myself, Kelsey Dawson Walton, Director Simons, and Director Heather Douglas. Superintendent Corey McIntyre and General Counsel Tim Palmatera are also present in the boardroom. The superintendent's cabinet and other district administrators are seated in another conference room with the live stream of this meeting being shown on a monitor. Individuals will come into the boardroom as needed. So those who can, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And Director Brooks, will you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Board members, in front of you is the agenda. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Is there a motion to accept the agenda as printed? I move to accept the agenda as printed. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion passes 6-0. The next agenda item is audience opportunity to address the school board. Today we have one speaker. Um, the orange card? Yeah. Yep. Um, Um, I, refu uh, I will um, review a few of the guidelines for that um, for those that will speak to the board. During audience opportunity to address the school board, I will call on each speaker who has submitted a speaker card. We ask that speakers keep their commitments to three minutes. The board does not take action or discuss matters during this portion of the meeting. Speakers may be referred to the superintendent or staff if follow-up is necessary. The complete guidelines for the public participation are provided on the meeting materials table and on the school board section of the district website. So when I call your name, please come to the microphone and state your topic and also state whether or not you are a district resident. Per the governor's executive order 2081 item 10C, speakers may remove their face coverings when addressing the board if, if they cho so choose. And so long as the social distancing requirement of six feet or more is maintained. After each speaker has finished, the podium microphone will be cleaned. And we have one speaker, Jean Fox. Good evening, school board. Good evening. Good evening. Superintendent McIntyre. My name is Jean Fox. I'm also a resident of Maple Grove and I'm also an employee. Thank you for letting me speak to you tonight. The numbers tell me that this is my 15th year in the district. Prior to that, I subbed for three years in this school district my, <coughs> while my kids attended the building of Oakview Elementary. I currently support the EL department at Park Center Senior High as an ESP and I'm also the only ESP float for Kids Stop and I'm also the lead ESP mentor. I come to you tonight to discuss how distance learning is going. Every day proves to be some kind of challenge either with my Wi-Fi and internet or our students as I watch as three siblings try to share that at home and become frustrated. This proves to be disheartening for them and very frustrating why we're trying to teach them. Google Meets start Monday through Thursday at 7.30 a.m. 
Each class runs 85 minutes. During this class time, I'm spending time supporting staff, students, as they teach new content, and we utilize it in the classroom. Breakout rooms, jam boards, peer deck, cami, seems to be just some of the new lingo in my life and our students' lives. Fridays start at 7.30 in the morning with study halls, and we end at 2 o'clock, helping students with their work that they might be missing or not understanding. High school supports end at 2 o'clock, and at times we sometimes have tutoring afterwards from 2.30 to 4.30 in our EL department. KidStop has once again pivoted to a new model, all in before and after school child care. We have gone from emergency child care to distance learning to all in. Never can say things aren't exciting. Little did I know that conversations about how cute your masks are would be an icebreaker for the kids as I float from building to building. As an ESP, it's rewarding supporting our students, but as we are currently now in a year with no contract, we don't know if ours will be cut, our health insurance has gone up, ESPs are not sure about what tomorrow will bring at times. I stand here in hopes that once again we will not be the last ones to know or the first ones to go. Since this all hit in March of 2020, I have taken supplies to students' homes. I have picked up items to be delivered to DLA. I received um, and handed out technology devices. I spent time in my car just before winter 30 break seconds remaining. delivering to our homeless students. We are gearing up for access testing in EL, registration for next year, while trying to maintain some semblance of normalcy. I invite any of you to come join any of our Google Meets. We do play games. <laughs> this is more than a job. We are the mission as ESPs. It is with great pride that I tell you ESPs help our students support their dreams so they can be successful, not only academically, but also contribute to communities. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Our next agenda item is a superintendent's report. Superintendent McIntyre. All right, thank you. Good evening. It's nice to be back and see you all in person. Um, just getting old to be on the computer screen all the time, right? So thank you all for being here um, and back, and thank you to our audience. Um, tonight we have a number of points of pride to get to, but before I get to that, uh, I wanted to, to take a moment to recognize our ESPs. Governor Wallace has proclaimed January 25th through 29th, 2021 as Paraprofessional Recognition Week. In, in our district, we refer to them as ESPs, and we have over 800 educational support professionals in Osseo area schools who work very hard every day to make sure that every child has the education they need to succeed in school and life. In a year, as you just heard, that looks so different than it ever has before, we are incredibly thankful for our ESPs whose support of and dedication to our students and families to help achieve our mission for every student is so critical. So to all of our Osseo ESPs, thank you. And so now tonight I'll go into our number of points of pride that we have to review and under the category of achieving dreams, which I think Joan's going to help me move through some slides here, we have two seniors from Park Center's uh, senior high class of 2021 and are among nearly 1,500 scholars nationwide who were awarded full four-year scholarships and admission to top colleges and universities through the national nonprofit QuestBridge. So congratulations to seniors Matt Velasek and uh, Jalea Yang, who were selected as a, to be part of the 2020 uh, QuestBridge National College Match, which is a program that connects high-achieving high school seniors and scholarships to the nation's top colleges. So both um, Matt and Jalea um, will be able to uh, take advantage of that opportunity for, given to them through this process. So we're very excited for them and, and well, uh, join me in well, uh, congratulating them in their honor here. And it looks like they're both uh, receiving scholarships to Stanford University. Um, our 279 online program, we've been hearing a lot about this the last few weeks. Our district's new 100% online school received nearly 1,500 applications for grades K through two in a three week priority application window. This new full-time offering for the 21-22 school year 
will allow students who prefer 100% remote learning to achieve their academic dreams in our virtual environment. The school has already attracted 50 students from outside our district as well. So we're excited to uh, continue moving forward with that. Also this year, 32 District 279 high school students earned state bilingual and multilingual seals or uh, achievement awards showcasing their aptitude in French, Hmong, and or Spanish. Scholars from all three comprehensive high schools in the district earned honors by demonstrating exceptional, exceptional listening, speaking, reading, and writing language skills on the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages assessment last spring, as you can see by their banner there. We're very uh, proud of that accomplishment. Congratulations to uh, 271 Osseo area school students who earned AP scholar recognition from the college board based on advanced placement exams taken during the 1920 school year. This number includes nine Maple Grove senior high students who earned the National AP Scholar Award, which is the highest AP honor and granted to only students who receive an average score of at least four on all AP exams taken and scores of four or higher on eight or more AP exams. In the category of contributing to community, Last month, families at Maple Grove Middle School contributed materials to create thousands of art kits for the University of Minnesota's Children's Hospital in St. Anne's Place. Maple Grove Middle School Assistant Principal Jennifer Hinker organized this activity to give back and really make a difference in the lives of children served by the hospital. On January 13th, the Minnesota Vikings, Midwest Dairy, and Fuel Up to Play 60 awarded a $10,000 hometown grant to support a new grab-and-go breakfast program at Brooklyn Middle Steam School. The hometown grant program developed by Fuel Up to Play 60 and the NFL identifies deserving, deserving schools and awards grants to help them meet their health and wellness goals. The new grab-and-go breakfast program will be, on the first, will be one of the first of its kind in our uh, school district and will make breakfast more available to students at Brooklyn Middle, helping them fuel their bodies and better uh, prepare for the school day and I was uh, able to participate in that event and we thank the all that participated and our students that joined and participated in some trivia uh, throughout the event and I was very impressed with the knowledge of our students um, they were very motivated for some prizes uh, near lifelong learning two district alums are making headlines this month Emily Ford Osseo senior class of uh, 2010 also senior high class of 2010 is on a mission to become the second person and first woman to complete a winter hike through of the 1200 mile ice age trail. And uh, Belay Frizzell, let me get this correct, Maple Grove Senior High Class of 2015 organized a statewide rally to call attention to systemic racism in healthcare and to launch the University of Wisconsin Madison's chapter on the student organization White Coats for black lives. So congratulations. Before winter break, st students at Zanewood Community School debuted a virtual fair of creative projects. Many of these creations were made in Zanewood's maker space, uh, science lab, art studio, and engineering lab over the past year with the help of community partners. So great to see those new um, initiatives fully at work with our students. In the area of mission-driven employees, Michelle Denard, an educational support professional who served in our special education program and students in our district for the past 16 years, has been named the Minnesota ESP of the Year by uh, Education Minnesota. This award recognizes uh, Michelle's outstanding leadership, community engagement, and personal achievements. We're very proud to have um, Michelle as the ESP of the Year here in Osseo. And finally, Congratulations to Birch Grove Assistant Principal Keisha Davis, who was recognized by the Minnesota Elementary Schools Principals Association and the National Association of Elementary School Principals as the state's outstanding Assistant Principal of the Year. This award recognizes Davis's leadership in the areas of restorative practice and cultural re responsiveness. Congratulations. Chair Dawson Walton, that is uh, my board report for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We certainly have a lot to be proud of in our district. Um, our next agenda item is school board committee reports. 
Director Brooks, do you have a committee reporter update? I had one brief meeting with the Brooklyn Bridge Alliance. Um, my first official meeting with them is actually tomorrow um, where we'll be discussing an interim strategic plan and um, revisiting the process to elect officers. Um, so I hope to have more of an update then. Um, I did not get very far in the last meeting, so. Thank you. Thank you. Director Grady, do you have any committee reporter update? I didn't, thank you, Director. Um, I went to the first meeting with the Northwest Suburban Integration School District, which is a collaboration of seven school districts in the Northwest Metro. And they are definitely grateful to Director Jackie Mosqueda Jones for her service and wanted me to pass that along. I also went to a first meeting of a long range financial planning advisory. And of course, I'm a part of ongoing meetings with the ECAP process, which is the equity context analysis process. And we are really getting going on starting to collect data right now. So I'm looking forward to that process moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Director Mesquita Jones, do you have a committee reporter update? Uh, yes, I do. On January 14th, District 287 um, Joint Board met. We had our organizational meeting um, where um, we said goodbye to um, Heather Douglas and thanked her for her service. And then um, uh, swore in some new members and elected um, officials. We also got um, notice of the retirement of the superintendent, Sandra Lewandowski. She'll be retiring in 2022. And so District 287 will be entering um, into a, a superintendent search. On Thursday at our next meeting, we will be um, hearing about the update on the learning model for our kids in District 287. Thank you. Uh, Director Simons, do you have a committee reporter update? Um, I don't have an official committee uh, report. However, I do sit on the CETA Planning Advisory Committee, um, which is the Center for Innovation and the Arts. Um, it's a joint effort across different cities, um, including Brooklyn Park and Maple Grove, um, for a collaborative and flexible space for a Center for Innovation Arts in Brooklyn Park um, at the at North Hennepin Community College campus. And so, our interest in that particular project would be the potential opportunity um, for programming related to the arts for our district. So um, that con project continues to be um, in the planning stages. It did not receive um, bonding funding uh, last in the last cycle. However, the meeting included our legislators um, who are going to be representing the project in seeking bond funding in the next cycle. Uh, they're also working on private fundraising, so that project continues to move forward, and we're hopeful that it will still continue to present an opportunity for our students in our district and our partnership on that project. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, Director Douglas, do you have any um, committee reporter update? I do not. And I do have a quick update report of the AMSD, Association of Metropolitan School Districts. We had our, um, earlier in January, we had our legislative um, breakfast um, virtually with, um, the, and the governor and lieutenant governor attended, and um, they were able to hear from many uh, districts um, just kind of some of the concerns this year. We had the majority and the minority speaker there in attendance, as well as many legislators, so it was really good. Um, the next meeting is um, scheduled for Friday, February 5th. That's all I have today. So we have three presentations this evening. Uh, first is the World's Best Workforce Report, led by Michael Lehan, Assistant Superintendent of Equity and Achievement, and Jeremy Willey, Director, Department of Learning and Achievement. Check, check. Check, check. Perfect. All right, good evening, board members, Superintendent McIntyre, fellow cabinet members, and members of the viewing audience. Good evening. 
With me this evening is Jeremy Willey, Director of Learning and Achievement. This evening, the outcome of our presentation is to examine various data points related to Osseo Area Schools, World's Best Workforce Strategic Plan from the 2019-2020 school year. As each of you knows, we have been in a variety of learning models since last year, which has interrupted our traditional schooling experience and traditional ways in which we assess continuous scholar growth. As such, within this presentation, you will see different modalities, methodologies, as we begin to make meaning from the data we have. We continue to be reflective of our work and stay committed to creating conditions so we emerge from this reality more resilient and with greater capacity to improve. To begin our conversation around this work, we wanted to highlight the connection between our newly developed strategic directions as part of our strategic planning efforts over the course of the last year and world's best workforce goals and legislation. We would also be remiss if we didn't highlight and acknowledge the Due North Minnesota Education Plan. As we present tonight, the data we have pulled and our responses to the data positions us well to aggressively pursue the deliverables articulated in that plan. At this time, I welcome Jeremy Willey, Director of Learning and Achievement. Jeremy? As we look at a multitude of data points, it is important that we begin by grounding us in the statutory requirements related to World's Best Workforce legislation. The five World's Best Workforce goals are listed here for you on this slide. Each year, school districts are required by the state to submit a world's best workforce plan and to share information in a public meeting. This plan was due for submission on December 15th, 2020. It was submitted on time and it can be found on our district website. Here, you will see the six adopted strategic directions for Osseo area schools, which we will focus on throughout our presentation this evening. While the final two strategic directions may not have a specific connection to the information shared in this presentation, the connections can be made between the first four and the aforementioned world's best workforce goals. These connections will be highlighted throughout the remainder of this presentation when applicable. The first world's best workforce goal that we would like to highlight in this presentation is each student is ready for kindergarten. Our next slide shows the pre and post assessment achievement data for pre-K <clears throat> students in our system using the Teaching Strategies Gold or TS Gold assessment. This assessment is designed to provide us with information regarding the extent to which pre-K students are ready for kindergarten. It measures early literacy, early numeracy, and social emotional skill development. You will notice that the lighter blue bars show the pre-assessment percentage of proficiency, while the post-assessment bars indicating proficiency are shown in a darker blue. One point to mention is that in 2016-2017, the pre-assessment was administered in the winter of that school year, while the following three years, it was administered early in the fall. This additional learning helps explain why the pre-assessment percentage was higher than in subsequent years. Additionally, another point to mention is to note that the post-assessment results from 2019-2020 were not available as we were unable to administer the assessment due to the pandemic and subsequent school closures. In this presentation, we're offering some new data on elementary course grades that we have not reported on before, so it should be considered as baseline data. This is what each of the marks mean. Four is excellent, exceptional, extended, Three is proficient, consistent, accurate. Two is basic, simple, inconsistent. One is limited, insufficient evidence. And NA means that the standard was not assessed or there was a lack of attendance or engagement. This analysis includes all students enrolled since October 1st, 2020. This also excludes NA marks if most students in the school, course, and grade were marked NA because we see this as an indication that these standards were not assessed. Color coding compares all groups on the same row. We're reporting three indicators of the level to which students were ready for kindergarten. 
The first row in each table is the most minimal level, the percent of kindergartners who demonstrated attendance and engagement to be assessed on the standards. The second row is the percent who did work at least at the basic, simple, or inconsistent level in each of their courses. The third row in each table is the percent that were proficient or excellent in all of their courses. The color coding shows that white students achieved rates that were above the other groups, especially when looking at percent proficient or excellent. At this level, in the all marks three plus row, five groups have rates that are less than half the rates for white students. Black, Hispanic, special education, students receiving free meals, and English learners or EL students. Again, these are baseline data collected during the pandemic, so these percentages should increase significantly in the future. As we shared at the beginning of this presentation, new from what you saw last week is that we, are, we wanted to incorporate our response to the data. So I'd like to highlight a couple of the bullet points that you see there. Creating alignment in end of year success criteria for four year olds programming. End of year success criteria was developed for students attending various pre-K learning opportunities within our system. This criteria focused on SEL, literacy, art, math, science, and physical development and movement. Another one that I'd like to highlight is strengthen alignment between area child care providers and Osseo area schools to ensure each kindergartner is, is kindergarten ready. Information regarding early childhood screening is provided. Home visits to in-home child care providers are conducted and resources around kindergarten readiness, social emotional development, and literacy and math skills are provided as well. The second world's best work for goal that we would like to highlight in this presentation is each third grader can read at grade level. On this slide, we can see the results of the 1920 Winter FastBridge Assessment. FastBridge is our newly adopted early literacy screener and benchmark assessment, and it is given in the fall, winter, and spring. Last winter was the first assessment window in which this assessment was widely given. In this chart, we can see two pieces of information. The first are the blue bars, which represent the percent of students whose scores indicated that they are at low or very low risk for needing reading intervention. The second bars are yellow, which show the percent of students whose scores indicated that they are projected to be on track for proficiency on the MCA reading assessment. One takeaway from these data is that being at low risk for needing intervention does not necessarily mean a student is on track for meeting state standards as measured by the MCA. One other item to note is that the kindergarten assessment is different from the assessment used at grades one through five. Kindergarten students take the early reading assessment, while grades one through five take the curriculum-based measurement for reading assessment. On this next slide, you will see that we will begin looking at our Minnesota Comprehensive Assessment, or MCA, results. Despite the fact that MCA testing did not occur in the spring of 2020, we wanted to provide you with a brief overview of our most recent level of performance as compared to the state in each of our three grade band ranges and content areas. This graph shows the percentage of proficiency for elementary overall. This would be our third, fourth, and fifth grade students in the areas of reading, mathematics, and science. The gold bar on the left column of each of these three content areas shows our percentage of proficiency in Osseo area schools. The dark purple bar on the right column of each of these three content areas shows the state's percentage of proficiency overall. As you can see, Osseo area schools was approximately 4% below the state average in reading and math, and approximately 12% below the state average in science. Please note only fifth grade students take the MCA in science at the elementary level. Some examples of how we are responding to this data, I'd like to call your attention to conducting academic and behavior planning to meet individual needs of all learners through multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS approach, utilizing data from FastBridge to inform our practices. 
Beginning last year, instructional assistants, academic skills, and Title I lead teachers have been meeting to collaborate and establish more consistency in intervention programming. These meetings occur on a monthly basis. Staff development assessment specialists will be meeting with talented and gifted teachers to better understand ways in which they can continue to support classroom teachers in differentiating instruction for scholars. At this point in the presentation, we'll be transitioning into MCA results for our middle schools. This graph shows the percentage of proficiency for middle schools overall. So this would be our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students, again, in the areas of reading, mathematics, and science. As you can see, Osseo area schools was approximately 4% below the state average in reading, 7% below the state average in math, and approximately 12% below the state average in science. Again, only our eighth grade students take the MCA in science at the middle school level. Finally, we can take a look at our MCA results at the high school level. This graph, again, shows the percentage of proficiency for high schools overall. So in this case, we'd be referencing our 10th and 11th grade students in reading, math, and science. As you can see, Osseo area schools was approximately 2% below the state average in reading, 8% below the state average in math, and approximately 6% below the state average in science. Only 10th grade students take the MCA in reading, only 11th grade students take the MCA in math, and students completing biology take the MCA in science at the high school level. The third world's best workforce goal that we would like to highlight in this presentation is each student graduates from high school. The top section of the table contains four year graduation and dropout rates for the last seven years as reported by the Minnesota Department of Education in 2020. These are also called on time graduation and dropout rates. We anticipate receiving results for the class of 2020 at some point in time this spring. When we add our four year graduation and dropout rates together, it accounts for approximately 90%. That is because at that point, about 10% of our students were continuing in high school or had an unknown status. The district has had a higher graduation than the state for each of these years. We were about five percentage points above the state in 2014 and are currently about a half a point above the state. The district had a lower dropout rate than the state for all but 2019, the most recent data available. In the bottom section of the table, we're looking at seven-year rates, which is the status of students three years after their typical on-time graduation year. At this point, when we add up the graduation and dropout rates, two to five percent of students are still continuing on or are unknown. As we saw with the four-year rates, our district seven-year graduation rates have remained above the state average for each of the past seven years. For most of these years, Osseo's seven-year rate has been above 90%, and the statewide average has not achieved that rate once. However, our seven-year dropout rates have also been above, above the state average for all but one of these years, indicating that after three years of additional efforts to engage students and help them complete their graduation requirements, about 8% of our students have dropped out. In order to better understand how our students are doing, we will review the four-year graduation and dropout data for the class of 2019 released by the Minnesota Department of Education as a part of the North Star State Accountability System. Three large districts in Minnesota that are most comparable to Osseo in terms of the demographics of the students served are Bloomington, North St. Paul, Maplewood, Oakdale, and Robbinsdale. By looking at how specific student groups perform relative to these districts, we get a better understanding of our strengths and of our challenges. First, we can use the color coding to see that in all four districts, Asian, white, and female students consistently had the most favorable graduation and dropout rates. The least favorable rates were for homeless students and SLIFE students, which are students with limited interrupted formal education. SLIFE students are an important subset of English learners. Second, when we look specifically at Osseo students, we can see that 
our overall graduation rate is within one-tenth of a percentage point of the best rate among the four districts. However, our dropout rate is the highest among the four districts and almost twice as high as those of higher performing districts. Third, the student groups in Osseo with the lowest graduation rates in 2019 were Slife, Homeless, American Indian, Multiracial, Special Education, and Hispanic. The student groups in Osseo with the highest dropout rates in 2019 were Slife, Homeless, Multiracial, Hispanic, EL, and students receiving free or reduced price meals. Finally, our district has the largest gender gaps with female students 8% more likely to graduate on time and half as likely to drop out as male students. We can see that some of our smallest groups become too small to report at this level when we disaggregate by gender within race and service groups. Female and male Asian and white students had the highest graduation rates and lowest dropout rates. The lowest graduation rates were for male students who were American Indian, homeless, multiracial, or Hispanic. Female homeless students also had a low rate. The highest dropout rates were for male students who were multiracial, Hispanic, homeless, or receiving free or reduced price meals. Female homeless students also had a high dropout rate. As we begin to reflect on this data, an example of our response is we engage in deeper analysis of individual students' credit accumulation and graduation status, identifying patterns to inform supports and further preventative measures based on what we've learned. The fourth world's best workforce goal that we would like to highlight in this presentation is each student is ready for college and career. Before we get into the ACT data, it is important to provide context around our planned administration for the spring of 2020. Due to the COVID-19 school closures, we were unable as a district to offer the ACT assessment. However, students did have the option to take the assessment on their own or during the fall of 2020 at a school site. Because of these changes in ACT administration, the data resulting from the assessment is not consistent with previous years and trend data will not be available. Now we will take a look at ACT college readiness benchmarks information for the 2020 graduates by test subject and compared to the state. The blue bars within this chart indicate the percent of district graduates that met the ACT benchmark for each subject. The yellow line that extends beyond the blue bar indicates the percent of students statewide who met each subject ACT benchmark. The bar the furthest to the right within the chart indicates the percent of students that met all four benchmarks within the district compared to students statewide. District graduates generally trail the state by eight to 11%, with the largest difference being in math, an 11 percentage point difference. The smallest gap between district graduates and the state is the percent meeting all four benchmarks, which shows district graduates at 6% lower than the state. Here we are comparing graduates from the class of 2019 and 2020 within each student group to see higher education enrollment before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. White, female, and Asian students had the highest rates of higher ed enrollment in 2019 and 2020. Five groups had higher education enrollment rates that were below 60% for one or both years. American Indian, Hispanic, EL, students receiving free or reduced price meals, and special education students. Five groups had an increase in higher education enrollment or had a reduction that was less than the nationwide drop of 4%. These groups were American Indian, Asian, multiracial, and female students. Hispanic, EL, and special education students all had a drop in higher education enrollment in 2020 that was twice as high as the national average. When we look at gender within other student groups, we can see that in all but two student groups, our female graduates in the class of 2020 were more likely than males to enroll in college. 
the gap favoring females was 20% or higher for American Indian, Asian, and homeless graduates, and 13% or higher for black, Hispanic, white students receiving free or reduced price meals and for special education. The two groups in which male graduates were more likely to enroll in college were multiracial students and EL students. In response to this data, I'd like to call your attention to assisting in designing pathways for students and researching potential post-secondary opportunities using wrap-up to readiness curriculum and the Minnesota Career Information System, MCIS, for my personal plan and student portfolios. This statutory requirement, one in which each student is required to begin the development of a personalized plan prior to entering ninth grade at the high school. Ramp up to readiness curriculum resource is a curriculum resource that students engage in during advisory in sixth through 12th grade. This resource focuses on financial, social, emotional, academic, admissions, and career readiness. The fifth world's best workforce goal that we would like to highlight in this presentation is the achievement gap is closing on all state mandated measures. First, we will look at information about students meeting ACT college readiness benchmarks as we looked at earlier, but this chart shows only rates of students meeting the benchmark in all four subjects, disaggregated by race and ethnicity. Again, the rates of District 2020 graduates are represented by the blue bars and the state is represented by the yellow bars in the chart. Two years of data are shown to examine differences that may have occurred during the COVID-19 school closure. This chart shows gaps between student groups in the rates of students meeting all four college ready benchmarks. This gap is consistent across years. Within most groups, students statewide have had higher percentages of meeting all four ACT benchmarks than district graduates. This is true except for among white district graduates who are slightly higher than the state percentage both years. Another insight is that there is a gap between white students and students of color, particularly when comparing the rate of white students to black students, we see gaps of 35 and 31 percent in meeting all four ACT benchmarks. Lastly, these data show that gaps in meeting all four ACT benchmarks between students of color and white students are larger for district students than students statewide due to the rates of white students being higher than the state and rates of students of color being lower than the state. On this slide, we look again at 2020 graduate ACT data, but this chart shows average ACT scores by race and ethnicity. We see similar trends in these data as in the benchmark data with white students earning slightly higher average scores than the state average and students of color scoring slightly lower than the state average. We also see similar gaps between the average scores of white students and students of color with the largest gaps being between white and black students six points, and white and Hispanic students, five points. This is a new chart that combines graduation, dropout, and higher education enrollment data. We are looking at the education attainment status of the class of 2019 in the year following on-time graduation from high school, which was the 2019-20 school year. Overall, we can see that over 60% of students that were in the class of 2019 graduated in four years and entered higher education in the fall of 2019. White, Asian, and female students had college going rates that were above the district average and dropout rates below the district average. The groups with the lowest college going rates were American Indian, special education, EL, multiracial, and Hispanic. This chart gives us a more complete picture of achievement gaps because it accounts for students who did not graduate when looking at higher education. For example, the gender gap in higher education enrollment increases from 11% to 15%, and the black-white gap increases from 16 to 22%. This last chart was developed to see how our graduation rates, our graduation rate gaps are changing over time. We subtracted each non-white graduation rate from the white graduation rate to calculate the size of the gaps. 
We then compared the class of 2013 to the class of 2019. Over these six years, most non-white student groups in Osseo made progress in closing four-year graduation rate gaps. This includes Asian, Black, Hispanic, e English learners, students receiving free or reduced price meals, special education, and male students. Gaps for homeless, multiracial, and female students grew. Again, as we reflect on our data, one of the items I'd like to um, pull your attention to is deepening our engagement in the use of culturally responsive instructional strategies. Such professional development has been offered during system staff development through the creation of new interdisciplinary Native American units for third grade students, a work with National Urban Alliance, and through learning pathways focused on student-centered learning and increased capacity for racial equity, which have been developed in collaboration with our Department of Educational Equity. At this time, I turn it back over to Chair for any questions. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we had a lengthy presentation a couple of weeks ago at our work session. Um, and so let's um, start off with some, I'll start with Director Douglas. Do you have any questions or comments? Um, I don't have any questions. Like you said, we've had extensive conversation about this um, at our work session um, and received lots of communication about it. I just want to say that I feel like, and I, I think the sentiment is shared, that this is just further evidence to support the need to get our kids back in school so that we can provide equitable outcomes for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Simon. Um, no questions um you know clearly this is concerning data it continues to be concerning data i'm hopeful um for our promising promises promising practices <laughs> work i found that work previously very insightful to correlate um, in classroom strategies with student success so be able to really isolate what's working and repeating that is really important to me um, in order to make meaningful progress so to me it comes down to what what's the practical insight to actually create a change in these outcomes. So, and that's entirely our strategy work um, and our priority work that we're doing. So hopefully we can get back on track with that soon um, so that we can drive the turnaround change that we've been wanting to um, as, as a, the previous board and new board um, that we need to do and want to do. Thanks. Dr. Mosqueda Jones. Um, I. Thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I also appreciate that it was shorter than the last time. <laughs> um, I, I do have one question that I don't think I um, asked beforehand. The kindergarten marks for fall is baseline. I'm interested in our um, standards-based grading. Are we, um, is the standard for the end of the year that where we want them to be or does it change throughout the year? Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. So, so like if by the end of the kindergarten year we want them to read X amount of sight words, is that what we, so we expect kids to have ones and twos in the beginning of the year and we expect them to have threes and fours. To progress toward that threes and fours at the end of the year. Yes. Yeah, I think that makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Um, how we look at the data. Thank you, appreciate it. And I especially um, appreciate the actions um, for how we're going to address each of these disparities. Thank you, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Director Brooks. Um, yeah, so uh, first I just wanna say thank you for the presentation um, and more importantly, thank you for the research and follow-up after the last presentation. You're welcome. Um, and providing more information. Mm -hmm. um, I'll limit my question today just to the environment that we're in right now um, on the slide related to or the slides related to graduation rates and dropout rates. Um, just wondering if you could talk a little more about how our district is doing compared to um, uh, districts of a similar size, similar resources, similar demographics. Um, like what are they doing differently to get those lower numbers? Um, yeah. How are they measuring touch points? I know we mentioned the Check and Connect program, but um, yeah, talk a little more about you know, what those districts are doing differently. Okay. 
Yeah, I think for the purposes of this presentation, what we were hoping to really look at were a set of comps, if you will, for districts that uh, as closely matched our demographic um, information as possible. Um, so in looking at that, we didn't necessarily look at districts that were as big as Osseo area schools in terms of size. So I say that to offer, we didn't compare ourselves to Minneapolis in this sense, nor did we do that with, with St. Paul. Um, that's absolutely something that we can do, and I think that that would provide us with additional information uh, that would be helpful and insightful. I think um, there are a number of us that are involved in different networking circles where we engage in conversation around um, what people are doing. I know that many of the efforts, particularly around pathways toward graduation and working one-on-one -on -one individually with students at the high school level, is really a comprehensive undertaking that takes place at the site level with administrative teams and support teams. So I know that that's a very integral part of their work. As far as any specific information that I can share around um, the, um, the individual actions that they take to impact that, um, that's something that I don't have as much access to, but it's certainly something that Michael and I can circle back with you on and after speaking with each of our high school leaders. Director Brooks, I would also add that um, Jeremy and his team, Tom Watkins and Jenna, they also uh, provide schools data. At the high school last year, I had a dropout predictability um, assessment that Tom was able to provide, which kind of triangulated the data of grades, attendance, suspension, some of those items, and tr while triangulating that information, we are able to the, the individuals who are at risk kind of rose to the top. So with those, as Jeremy talked about, those are the individuals who we partnered with, uh, student assistant team and so forth, and assess what supports we can provide. Now, obviously our reality is a bit different uh, currently, but some of those same data points will help shine some light on how we need to intervene and how quickly we need to intervene, which arguably is <laughs> very quickly, so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director Grady, I just was going to say, <laughs> Director Grady, sorry. <laughs> Hard to get used to. Um, thank you very much to both of you for the presentations. Um, I understand my own experience and my experience of others is that it takes a lot to get a kid to graduate, especially if they're taking a non-linear or non-traditional path towards that. Do we have enough guidance counselors to help support our kids through that system to be able to find you know, that path towards graduation? Well, I, I'd be willing to speculate that if my uh, counterpart in student services would hear, was here, she would <laughs> gladly advocate for as many counselors as she could possibly have. I think um, from my experience working in other systems, I feel as though we have some of the best counselors that I have ever come across at all three levels. Uh, I continue to be amazed by the things that they do, how collaborative they are, how student-centered they are. Uh, they are among the first people that when we reach out to ask them what we can do differently or how we can be better for kids. They are some of the most receptive and responsive people that we have. Um, I know that um, looking at counselors is something that um, Kate Emmons is consistently evaluating with um, her assistant director, Jill Linnae. I also know it's something that we've talked about in the past at our district planning advisory council. So I can speak to that interest. I know that that interest is there um, as far as the extent to which we have enough. I think in education, we're always looking for as many resources as we can possibly have, as Jackie can attest. Um, but all I can speak to specifically is just how wonderful the group is that we have. And Director, Director, oh, Director Gray, if I can jump in. A couple months ago, when we did our financial audit. They did point out our investment in support services is, is higher than this metro average. So we have a, a bit of a... Um, sustained commitment so far, and then I'll add on to the, the reality of the pandemic has changed that, and you saw that at the presentation at the work session, and I was encouraged uh, in the Due North plan to see the commitment to investing in additional resources for supports for schools. It was one of the seven pillars of the new plan. So, um, you know, when you compare ourselves to other districts, we're at or better than, but the demands on our system now have changed. So I was just talking with Director Emmons around 
maybe a reset and, and restudying what the needs are now because our reality has changed and looking at it uh, with through a new analysis and what what do we need to be in the future right so hopefully that helps thank you the picture for you Sorry to jump on you there don't know you're my boss it's okay <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> a little levity today um the only other piece that i would add is that i think that support is certainly critically important, but I also think interest is critically important as well. So one of the things that I know Assistant Superintendent Kelly Parpart is doing along with the secondary school principals is looking at pathways. This is a charge that was brought from the board and then Corey as well, as far as building a better future, doing a deep dive into what sort of learning pathways do we have, whether it be CTE, um, culinary, fashion design, what are those interests that our scholars have and how are we aligning our resources and our, and our opportunities to the interest of our scholars. So I think, yes, it's important to have supports, but also we need to continue to do self-studies to figure out what are the interests of our community and meet them where they are. Thank you. Um, my comment is, um, you know, it's, it's so hard to, to read this report and hear this report. Um, because year after year, uh, the, dat the data that we see, it, it tells the exact same story. Um, and it's just so alarming to me. Um, and, you know, I do appreciate, of course, the specific um, district responses. I think they're very, I think they're great tactics um, to really address um, the disparities that we're seeing. Um, and, you know, when I think about our last work session and all that information, it's all the things that we've asked for. and. Um, it really painted a full picture of where some of maybe the gaps are. Um, and I know, Mike, you've mentioned it before, you know, what you just actually said is it's like, how do we like take all of the things that we're doing in our district? Um, so it, it's like, you know, we've been talking about from the budget to all the strategic planning to really um, focus in and, and, and be really intentional. And I know that's where we're going. Um, so it's encouraging on one hand to see like that is where we're going, but I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. I mean, this, it's just sickening, I, this data. So um, so my question actually is about, um, and I haven't really had a chance to dig into it, but the governor's Do North framework um, that you mentioned earlier, Mike, but I think the rollout of it was a little underwhelming and like, what are we gonna do, you know, to address um, all of these issues that um, face you know, all districts, but, you know, our district too. And so I'm wondering, you know, one of the things I did read in there, they had said um, the plan will also help students recover from um, the learning loss or the lack of, you know, even being able to have a learning loss um, due to COVID. Um, are we involved in any of those conversations or will we be involved in some of those conversations um, as, as the plan kind of starts to really formulate for due north. Do you, does anybody know? Well, we, a lot of us weren't aware that that plan was oh. coming out this week, <laughs> honestly. So we really haven't been, you know, that it was really contained to a kind of a panel of mm -hmm. folks that he, he talked about mm -hmm. um, that were at the core of that planning. Um, I like the concept of, we, we've seen inter instruction interrupted so many times this mm -hmm. year. So it makes you wonder, is it lost or just things we never got to in the sure. first place mm -hmm. because of so many disruptions. So as it's being rolled out, we're really interested in the details and how we can be engaged in the, the, the implementation of those things, because mm -hmm. right now what we saw was concepts. And right. it really the, the details matter. So mm -hmm. it's getting into what um, specific things are art articulated in those larger seven areas. And we are pushing ourselves into that space mm -hmm when the opportunity comes up. I've already kind Good. of reached out to the <laughs> deputy commissioner and said we want to be at yes. the table when you start operationalizing this yep. um, because we need a roadmap. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's really this conceptual at this point. We need we need more actionable things to go with it. So right. it's a step, it but that, that's what comes next. It's I almost think. like we don't need more things. We need to just kind of consult, yeah. you know, get what works. Let, you know, let's yes. find the things that are working yeah. and, and get rid of the ones that are not. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go back around one more time, Director Douglas. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. Usually we just go once. <laughs> well, um, thank you. Um, you know, I really, I just really feel strongly that 
that we need to continue to to work towards these things. Um, Jerem Director Jeremy Willie and I have had lots of conversations about this being on DPAC, and so um, I feel that the um, the desire is here in this district, and it's just time for us to take action, really, to just be bold and take big action to make changes happen. And I think that this board is ready to do that. So um, just once again, thank you for the work that you've put in and the transparency with our community. Um, it is really difficult to talk about where our faults are, and they're really big faults. They're, they're, they're big areas, big gaps that need to be addressed, um, and the sooner the better. So thank you. Director Sonny? No, no further questions or comments. Director Mosqueda-Dolan. Yeah, actually, I forgot a question that um, I wanted to ask, um, and I can't find the slide right now, but um, on the slide where you were talking about um, the, the difference between kids who are projected to meet the standards on MCA and um, the kids who, set, who we determined do not need intervention. So there's a, there's a section, cross section of, yes. I would call it a hole, right? Um, what are we doing to triangulate, um, um, Assistant Superintendent Lehan kind of made me think of what are we going to do, or what are we doing to triangulate and um, predict who those kids are, or how are we going to uh, intervene to make sure that you know we are hitting literacy rates, things like that. So I think you're re the slide that. I'm thinking you're referring to is the one on Fast Bridge at the elementary level where one of the colors represented the percentage of students that were identified as being at very low or low risk. And I think that was might have been gold and then maybe in purple yep. there was a yep. bar that said yep. projected proficiency. Yep, it was Fast Bridge. <laughs> right. So I think that in looking at that assessment, um, it's an assessment that's given throughout the year. Um, as students are identified at elementary sites in particular, because we're talking about that with respect to FastBridge, um, there, are, um, there, are, there are a variety, it's education. So there are a variety of different acronyms that different sites call <laughs> these problem solving teams, these teams of staff and teachers and uh, support staff that get together, I'm sure you're familiar, um, and talk about students and, and identify students that are in need of intervention. They then move forward with the assignment of those interventions and they progress monitor student progress in those interventions on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis to try to see if they can move students from one risk area, move them out of one and into a, a lesser risk area so that then that in turn can help increase those projected proficiency rates. So that happens a little bit differently at different sites depending on um, the roles and responsibilities that they have and the staff that they have at their disposal. Um, but even as an elementary principal, that myself, that was something that we put a lot of energy into, was really targeting individual students on the student by student level and making some of those uh, literacy-based interventions as strategic and intentional uh, as possible and then making sure that we were assessing that on an ongoing basis to ascertain the extent to which something is working or not working, right? Do we continue with that intervention? Is it, do we offboard that intervention or do we consider a different approach to help meet the needs of those students? So with, with, with respect to FastBridge, it's, it's a newer assessment tool that we're using at the elementary level. Last year we used it, um, we used it in places. I, I, I would gently refer to it as we piloted it at some sites more so than at others, whereas this year it's just being used across the system. Um, so I'm hopeful that as we continue to get more familiarity with the assessment tool and the different online resources that it provides in terms of looking at student by student information, the more actionable and successful we can be on behalf of each of our students. My, my colleagues have been um, impressed with the Fast Bridge. Um, we're about the same place you are in Columbia Heights. Okay. Um, with Fast Excellent. Bridge, so that was interesting. Um, Gosh, there's one more thing that I wanted to say, but I think um, I just want to um, re reiterate that I'm hearing from administration in the in the district that we are being very intentional with our ECAP process and our strategic plan and bringing, this is what I was going to say, bringing families and students 
to the table to address these um, issues. I'm correct? Yes, right on? <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Director Brooks? I um, echo a lot of the same sentiment as my colleagues um, in the frustration um, that is felt when reviewing this data. Um, I did want to highlight, and it's something that I hope to dive in uh, more deeper at some point, but um, it looks like something is potentially working um, as it relates to MCA scores at the high school level versus elementary and middle. Uh, it appears that gap is kind of slowly closing, and I'm, I'm curious what is helping um, with that. Um, so I don't know if you have more to add on that now, and I certainly, again, want to look at that again later. Um, but also related to science, I'm also curious, um, you know, one of the questions that was kind of percolating in my mind as you were going through it is how we're tracking interest in science at the elementary, middle, and high school level. And then um, our seniors that actually enroll in uh, post-secondary um, science-related majors. Mm -hmm. um, it would be nice to sort of see that data and how that correlates with um, our success with you know, MCA or ACT um, science scores. Um, other th and I would say that's probably the one of the biggest question that I have right now. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and, and leave it at that. But yeah, I don't know if you can get some of that data or if we can include it next time or, or what, but it would be good to know. Sure, and you're right. I think if I'm remembering correctly, I think it was 12% difference at elementary and science, yeah. roughly 12% middle school, and then down it to eight. reduces down to, yeah, eight, six, something like that, that at high school. I think the other piece, and I referenced it at the work session too, just to quickly reference it again, is there's so much change that's happening uh, across the state with respect to the content area of science. We're talking about whole scale content um, within content areas moving from one grade level to another, um, standards being dramatically changed. So there's, there's lots of new and exciting opportunities in science. And uh, we have a number of different stakeholder groups at the elementary and the secondary level that are involved in taking action toward making those changes, some of which we've already done at the middle school level and we're hoping to expand that more at secondary and then do a comprehensive um, in elementary science pilot next fall. So there's exciting things coming with science, but I agree with you. I think it would be interesting to kind of see where students decide to go with respect to science when they exit our system. So that's something that I can ask my team about and see if we can look into that. Thank you. Director Grady. Um, one small question that you could follow up with later if you'd sure. like is, do we have the demographic data on who ta actually takes the ACT? Because not all students take it, correct? Uh, all, students, uh, all students have the opportunity and all students take the ACT in our system, yes. Okay, all right. Um, and then I just wanted to build upon um, Director Dawson's point is that this data is local and I appreciate everybody's work in collecting it. As, a, as we all know, it's tragic for our students. And that this is, while the data is local, the problem is a national, cultural, socioeconomic issues that we're dealing with. So like moving into a complex problem that we're trying to solve, it has not been solved yet, so I want to really applaud everybody's effort for working really hard on that. I also want to add that this data is pre-exists the pandemic. And so we have learning loss or stuff that we haven't gotten to that's going to follow this. And so I'm really pleased that we have the baseline and the sense of urgency here in this room so that we can bring action use the data to bring action that our students and families need. Thank you. Okay, well thank you so much um, to your team. I think this is, I, like I said, the, I think the district responses are what's really encouraging um, with this. And I, you know, I also believe that to turn this around, it, it, it isn't just follow up and really echoing you, um, Director Grady, on our, on our own staff. It's, you know, a responsibility of our families and our students and so, and us as a board too. So. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay, so the next presentation is an update on Rice Lake Edition Construction led by Ron Meyer, our Executive Director of Finance and Operations. 
Once this is cleaned off, Mr. Meyer, take the stage. All right, good evening, uh, Chair Dawson Walton, Superintendent McIntyre, and school board members. In June of 2020, the school board approved the Building a Better Future facility improvement recommendations that were presented by Superintendent McIntyre. This approval included a building addition to Rice Lake Elementary School to address overcapacity concerns that have and continue to be projected to exist at the school. Since that time, we have had a dedicated team of stakeholders, including members of our facility staff, our Rice Lake Elementary staff, and our professional partners from Wold Architects and Engineers and ICS. So this evening, the board will hear an update on the pro progress of our planning, including some initial conceptual drawings, as well as a discussion on how the design um, incorporates elements of the school district's next generation learning space criteria that was established through the Building a Better Future process. So with that, we have several presenters this evening, and I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves as they come to the podium. First up is Lene Schoen, a partner for Wold Ex Architect and Engineer, who's gonna kick us off. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Superintendent McIntyre, Thank you so much for having us tonight. Uh, my name is Lene Schoen. I'm here with Wold Architects and Engineers, and with many of our team partners tonight, are very excited to give you all an update on the Rice Lake Elementary School project. Um, our agenda for this evening is to talk a little bit about the participatory planning process um, that we utilize for planning Rice Lake Elementary School additions. You're gonna see some views and some finishes for the classroom community edition and also for the gymnasium edition. We're gonna show you um, the current developments for the site, some building plans, and then again, some finishes. And then we'll have our ICS team um, wrap up the discussion on budget and schedule. We are at in the, um, the point in the process where the design is complete. We are wrapping up contract documents and we are preparing to uh, get those ready for bidding in February. So our presentation tonight is an update since the last time we've been with you so that you can see some of the images and excitement around the project. I would just like to share a little bit about um, the participatory planning process. You'll hear from some of the stakeholders here tonight on their involvement and, and what they were able to do as sharing um, their expertise as users for the facilities. But I just wanna ground us in the work of building a better future. Um, this, all of this work um, really started with the foundation of the work by the District Elementary Next Generation Learning Spaces Study Team. They really set the foundation for a lot of the guiding principles and some of the design criteria that was developed for this project. So that was the first prong approach. The second layer then was the development of a core planning group. That core planning group represented not only some district administration team members, but the principal at that site, teachers and parents, so that we could really get some great information and set the building plan with that team based on the function. The third prong approach to that planning, or the participatory planning, was the user group input process. So once the spaces were landed and organized in the additions, and we dis um, discussed how the additions were going to relate to the existing building, we again tapped into more planning groups that included district administration, uh, the principal at that site, and the teachers as well. So um, a lot of great input and stakeholder information. And with that, we'll turn it over to Margot, who will share a little bit about the planning process. Good evening, everyone. I'm Margot Clavin, proud principal of Rice Lake Elementary. And you, if you look on your screens, are going to see some schematic drawings of all the work that we've been working on since last August. 
So Lene talked about the three uh, different groups. I'm gonna start with group number two, which is the core planning group. This group met five times over August and September with the exceptional facilitation of Lene. Have never seen such great uh, facilitation skills. And then the Rice Lake community themselves, we actually had to meet four times outside that because Lene always gave us homework about <laughs> dig in a little deeper. What do you really want here? What are you trying to present at your building? So lots of hours came into this design as well as the common thread in all of our decision making with all the, the criteria that we needed to do was we really felt it was important to reinforce and strengthen the sense of community at Race Lake. Whether it's within a classroom, classroom to classroom, grade level, family, extension, specialists, etc. Being in relationship with each other is really the trademark of Rice Lake. And you're gonna, I think, feel that in our designs. So if you look at the schema that's up there right now, you'll see that it's a six classroom. Look to the upper right hand corner and you'll see something unique called an active lab. This is where we lean into the flexibility and community for our building, that this room we truly envision to be accessible to all K through five. And it's not gonna have carpet in it like the rest of the traditional classrooms. It's gonna have more of a rubberized floor. Um, it has multiple sinks. And so kind of think of it like a science lab. Um, so when third grade comes in and does their amazing crawfish experiment, they can set up in that room and then all the third grade classes can filter through. Uh, Pre-COVID, we had a resident artist that would always come in for our grade levels, and we could see her setting up her station in this room, and then the particular grade levels could filter through. If we need, that active lab can be converted to a regular classroom. So it's the same dimension, everything like that. So we're super excited about that piece. If you look in the center, that blue area, that is breakout space where we would envision modular furniture, kids being able to push out from the regular classroom into that space. So maybe they need to uh, read into their iPads and record something. They could push out into that space instead of being in their classrooms. That breakout space is also going to be available for K-5. So whoever is the lucky people that get to move into this wing it's still gonna be an area that can be shared by the entire Rice Lake community. Uh, you'll notice that the rooms have a pairing component to them. We want to utilize team teaching or small group teaching, and those paired rooms actually have access to each other within the room, so you don't have to go out into the hallway to enter in. So we're super excited about that. If EL wants to push in or special education pushes in, kids can just move freely between those rooms instead of having to go somewhere else in the building. Um, you'll notice that we don't have a locker bank. That was also very intentional because we wanted that breakout space in the middle to be maximized. So the classrooms are a little larger to accommodate that. And the only room that doesn't fit that is the active lab. Those um, lockers are actually outside on one of the walls because again, we wanna be prepared just in case we need to use that room. Uh, another thing that's unique about this addition is we don't have uh, a lot of storage inside the classrooms. We decided to uh, opt for a more shared approach so we don't have built-in cabinetry, we're not gonna have storage on wheels, we're actually gonna have a complete separate storage area to have that community feeling. Um, and lastly on this slide, if you look at the top, absolute top, you can see where the existing classrooms are, we wanted to be very intentional in including those classrooms into this new space. So really, we're not, we're not really getting a new six room wing. We kind of feel like we're getting an eight room wing. So again, just that collective use for all was really a component for this. Um, 
down or right do I press on this? Right, there we go. All right, so once that work was done, then we went and brought in a whole nother voice. And this is called the user input group. Not only was it uh, bigger in membership, but it was bigger in breadth. So we brought in representatives from the city of Maple Grove. We have district teaching and learning, technology, facilities, et cetera. And then we really widened the participation from Rice Lake. So we had reps from all grades, K through five. We had special ed at the table. We had EL at the table, music, PE, DAPES. And this massive group met anywhere upper 20, upper 20 meetings, not necessarily this whole group together, but sometimes we split off. And then their task was to take that drawing and then really dig in and put lots of details in, such as, all right, we've got these two rooms that we have access to each other. Where is that door going to be? What makes the most sense? Where's the location of the sinks? What's the bricks going to look like, et cetera? So we have another participant today. Jody Seppla is going to come up. She's Rice Lake Instructional Assistant, and she's going to highlight the work of the user input meeting. Jody? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, the whole family comes. Can you all see this? <laughs> 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 they do have their packet, too. So yeah, we have our packet. They can follow along mm -hmm. with their packet, too. Oh, you have it in, in yep. the packet? Okay, and viewers, are they able to see? Um, Could you accidentally press the wrong button? Because I think... Oh, here we go. Oh, there it is. All right, and then I want to go on to the floor again, so it's right side. There it is. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Jody Seppala. I am the instructional assistant at our school, and I was on the core planning team for the Rice Lake Edition project. And I want to echo what Margot said um, about how impressed we are that it was to see the final design reflect the things that we value as a Rice Lake community. And truly, that's a shout out, Lene, to you and the team. Just amazing work to be able to come to a meeting and have a collective set of ideas um, get milled around and then we would leave the meeting and we'd come back to the next meeting and here would be this beautiful depiction of our, our thoughts and our visions in, um, you know, in the form of design. So I really appreciated that part. It was definitely an artistic collaboration project. So uh, the user group then took the general structure that was given to them by the core planning group and they dug much, much deeper into the details of this space. So they made decisions from the perspectives of the users, the um, people and the children that would be in these spaces and would be living in this for instruction and learning. So I want to give you some examples of those things that you can possibly see on these pictures too. Uh, we talked about the paired classrooms and this group spent much time on uh, how big should that opening be between the paired classrooms? And should it be uh, clear glass or do we want that to be opaque openings for those two spaces? Where should it be along that wall? How much space is needed for traffic flow? Uh, this lot of talk about lockers, not just that we would have the lockers in the classroom, but what would the lockers actually look like? Would they be for single students or for pairs of students? Would they be open spaces or closed spaces? Um, we know it's Minnesota. We're going to have wet coats and boots. So where will those go when they're in the classroom? And what would the flooring be then underneath to accommodate that? So lots of great decisions there. Um, the flooring again, the difference between the uh, regular classroom and the active room made some decisions on that. Uh, we really, really wanted to maximize that breakout space and not have it be underutilized. We want that to be seamless between large group instruction in your classroom and then break out into that space. So it became important to think about 
the teaching spaces and what kind of line of vision do they have between their classroom and what's going on out in the breakout spaces. Um, and of course, it wasn't just from classroom use. We were also looking from the perspective of all users, uh, from EL, from special ed, technology, ESPs dealing with small group, and technology, believe it or not, is a huge discussion right now. You know, where do you put, store these devices? How do they get charged? So we went into, made some decisions on that, which brings in traffic flow. You have charging stations and all the children are trying to get to it. You know, how are you gonna accommodate that? Do we split it and have smaller charging stations? So decisions were made there. Um, again, we wanted to maximize the use of that atrium area for as learning space for children and spaces that children would be comfortable in, would be able to work in pairs or uh, small groups. Um, this group also looked at small group instruction. So you'll see a couple of spaces that are made and designed for that. And I believe one of them has a clear glass encasement. The other one is more closed. So really looked at seamless transition again between what's going on in the classroom and then the ability to just be able to move into small group as needed. Finally, this group looked into the gymnasium which were probably one of our biggest dreams came true when we talked about the natural lighting in our building that's low and they were able to pull in natural lighting into that gym. When you see that, I think you'll be wowed. Um, bleachers. At our school currently, we are limited on assemblies because we only have one gym and we aren't able to have our full uh, school in that gym. So we, this will open up an opportunity and by putting bleachers in there, we can have a full grade level in there to have assemblies or presentations or atriums, or excuse me, uh, lyceums. And we talked about the idea of field trips coming into the building as opposed to leaving to go to a field trip and how having those bleachers could really accommodate that. And again, the traffic flow, important pieces from leaving our building, passing by the gym, getting out to the recess area, getting back into the school and able to get to the lunchroom. So all of that traffic flow were the details that this group dealt with. And uh, the plan is just simply amazing. So thank you. And of course, access for community ed and a new parking lot. That's, you know, if you've ever been to Rice Lake and tried to park. <laughs> so a parking lot that will accommodate uh, community ed use of this space as well. We're very excited. And the project was not only the interior of the building, but also the outside. So we have Jill Berg here that is also going to take you through a layer of work on the development of outdoor classroom space. Hello everybody, my name is Jill Berg. I teach third grade at Rice Lake and I'm also a Rice Lake parent. You can see this image here. This is the initial plan for the outdoor classroom space. It is located in between the new classroom addition and the gymnasium addition. Uh, it is gonna start with a foundation of sidewalks and pathways and landscaping and brickwork and trees and then it's going to allow us to create an opportunity to partner with local businesses and community groups to kind of design and create the details of the space. So you can see there a geology station, there's a large group gathering space. The possibilities are endless here. You can build a pergola, have a butterfly habitat. Um, it's a place that can grow and change. It's not only going to be an asset for the Rice Lake community, but the entire uh, Northwest suburb community. It's going to be a fun place for all ages to hang out, relax, learn, and gather together. Um, and it's just beautiful. And it has been so much fun working on these committees. Thank you.
Okay, um, we are gonna show, take you through some um, views now of not only the site and then also the building. Um, I'm gonna start out here with the site diagram. Um, the site diagram is very similar to the site diagram that we had shown you at the very beginning um, of this project. Just wanted to point out to you that there are some synergies with the outdoor classroom, the soft play area. We got a lot of input from the city um, on after hours use and synergies um, with this whole complex. And so it's really starting to come together. Uh, but you can see that outdoor classroom that Jill just spoke of that's in between the classroom edition and the gym edition. I'm gonna show, show you a couple of images um, uh, for the gym. At this point, this is an exterior view. If you kind of go smack dab right down the middle of the view, um, the existing building is on your right hand side and then you can see the almost two story version um, of the brand new gym will be on the, on the left hand side there. You can see the openings that Jody talked about so there will be some natural light into that gym and that's actually a byproduct of creating a gym shelter. If you recall we were in front of you um, probably six months ago and talked about the state requirement to create a gym, sh uh, uh, a storm shelter on this site. Mm -hmm. And so we do have shuttered windows um, and that gym will be able to um, act as a, sh a shelter if needed. This is another exterior view. The new classroom edition is on the left. The existing building is on the right. We've got some um, light and some sun angles here that do not let you see the brick pattern, but I just wanted to share with everybody that we will be matching the existing building so that it will look like one um, uniform campus at the site. And then these are just a couple of samples um, of the window framing, um, some of the aluminum that we will be using as an accent, and then again, working on that brick and precast match for that site. This is a general three-dimensional view of the classroom community, and I think we've heard a lot about the planning process and activities that we anticipate to have in, uh, in this area. And then I just wanted to share a couple of three-dimensional views. These are computer generated, uh, but you can see as um, Margo and Jody and Jill talked about this collaborative area that's right here, um, front and center. To the right of this view where you see some blue flooring, that's that hard surface that you've heard about tonight. That's the active lab. So you can see how open that is and how that really connects with that extended learning area. You can see um, some countertop with some stools, some soft seating perhaps some provisions for technology out in this area as well. Um, the whole concept here is to allow for some of that choice. Choice for teaching options, choice for students to learn how they learn best. Uh, so a lot of flexibility is key. Another view here also of this learning commons. Um, you can now see on the left hand side of your view um, we're looking almost directly at that active lab. You can see the row of lockers that are right outside that active lab and right to the left of that is the door to go outside to that outdoor classroom. So you can see it's a real cohesive community in, that, um, in this classroom area here. This is a view of the active lab. Um, in place of the lockers, you're gonna see straight on there that we've got some cabinetry, a countertop, some sinks, hard surface flooring, perhaps flexible furniture, power that comes from the ceiling so that you have lots of opportunities to do whatever you can dream of uh, in this space. And this is a three-dimensional view of the gymnasium. As you're looking down, I'd just like to point out that the storm shelter is the gymnasium itself. It's the box, the large box with the dark black outline. The gymnasium as a storm shelter does have to be self-sufficient. So it does have its own mechanical, electrical systems. We do have to have toilet rooms right within that gymnasium area. Um, and so you will see that it's, it's pretty self-sufficient and a lot of that is for convenience as well. This is a view of that gym. You can see the lovely natural light on the right-hand side and the left-hand side of the view. You can see some acoustical panels. Um, you can see the gym flooring. You can see the pull-out bleachers on the left-hand side. Um, and I think one of the things that's important and exciting about this space is that if you were choose to choose to do a movie night or something like that in this area, you can actually activate those shutters on those windows and make it um, dark as well. This is an overview of the finishes and materials for the project. Um, we worked really closely with your facilities team to understand recent investments 
at that site and to not only complement and replicate them, um, but to look at what is the foundation of new finishes and materials for perhaps future work at that site as well. Um, all of these materials and finishes will be in Margot's building on display for her to share with her staff shortly, as well as all of these views and some boards um, to share that information. And then I'll turn it over to ICS to just give us an update um, as we go prepare to go out to bid on budget and uh, schedule. Thanks, Lene. Uh, Chris Seymour with ICS. Um, as we get towards the end here, we've been running estimates on the project that the documents that Wold and the consultants have been completing. Uh, we are tracking on budget, actually slightly under budget. And uh, with the favorable bid climate that we're experiencing right now, too, we don't anticipate any issues. But uh, a lot of interest moving into bidding. We're being contract, uh, contacted constantly by contractors. And uh, Side effect of COVID that's actually benefiting us in the construction world right now is that there really aren't a lot of projects out to bid right now. So uh, it is garnering a lot of interest, which is driving competition. And a lot of the school districts are benefiting in good bid day costs. So we anticipate that following through on this project. But again, we'll continue to garner support and uh, obtain bids, as noted here in the schedule. Um, <clears throat> So uh, as I noted, we're wrapping up our quality control review along with WOLD uh, and consultants of the documents so that we'll be issuing those uh, tentatively next Monday for bidders. Uh, we'll have a pre-bid walkthrough of the site for bidders available just to view the site, get information on the project, uh, to see if they're interested in bidding uh, on the 10th. And then we'd be bidding the project on the 4th of March, which is, in, is uh, on track with our project, bringing it to you in the board meeting of March tentatively for approval. And then as noted, there will be working construction through the spring, summer, and wrapping up uh, late fall, early winter for occup occupying. So, thank you. Well, that wraps up our presentation for this evening, but we certainly uh, Stand for any questions that the board may have. Okay. Well. Director Grady, do you have any questions or comments? Um, not at this time, but thank you very much for the presentation. It looks beautiful, and I can't wait to see happy students in there. Director Brooks. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, first I just wanted to um, just comment that I really like that all stakeholders were brought to the table for this. Um, and one of the questions that I have, or particularly parents, um, actually, but one of the parents I, or questions I have maybe for Margot is how you're including students in this, like how you're building um, excitement with students and sharing progress. And, um, you know, I think for a lot of kids, this is kind of a once in a lifetime Lego come to life moment. And so, um, yeah, it's, I think it's something exciting that they should also be a part of. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, that's maybe the only question is how, how students are currently involved. Truly, for the student community, it's going to be a big surprise. You know, this has been all the behind the scene work at the moment, but as Lene said, we're going to now be presented with uh, material boards and whatnot, and so that's going to be truly our first launch for kids. Uh, we've kept staff up to speed as well, um, but even with these pictures, they're just going to be wowed out of their mind <laughs> to, you know, we've been waiting um, and to see it come to fruition is, is just goosebumpy. In one of our meetings, when they really put up the first one, I just sobbed. I mean, it was just all this work and to see it. Yeah, so you are right, and we are going to maximize that excitement and celebrate, celebrate, celebrate every step of the way. Thank you. 
director, let's get it. Oh, do you mean it? I, I was just going to add to, you know, one of the things that we're looking at with this Rice Lake addition as part of the overall building a better future process and really looking at all of our facilities and integrating those next generation learning spaces. Um, this will give us an opportunity uh, when some of the, certainly some of those open spaces with some of the furniture and things like that to get some feedback from those students in terms of what's working well, what are some things that like, they like about it, maybe some things that they don't like, as well as with our facility staff, what's easy to clean, what are the things that are holding up over the uh, course of time. So it really gives us an opportunity to get some <coughs> of that student voice and feedback for as we replicate that throughout the system with our other projects as we move forward. Thank you. Director Mosqueda Jones. Uh, Mr. Meyer, if you can come back to the, to the podium, I appreciate it. Um, so that uh, spurred another question in my, in my brain. Um, the outdoor area, is there any area um, that kids will be able to um, engage in planning or manipulating or creating like their own. The reason I'm asking this is because at, at my school we had a courtyard that, and we did a project-based learning with the students where they learned so much more in that year of planning than I think they did, you know, up till then. And they created a, a multi-level garden for each grade level and, and, <coughs> third graders working with kindergartners, and it was just really amazing. And so I'm wondering if there's a piece of that land that, you know, we could give to the creativity of our um, awesome educators. That's a, a great question. So a couple of uh, things that I would uh, just draw our attention to. First of all, I think as uh, was presented in the presentation, that, um, that outdoor learning space right now is kind of going to be a phased approach. So we are certainly going to build the infrastructure uh, during this process, and then uh, Margo and her team are really going to work, and, and certainly our the district uh, district level as well will work to build those partnerships and relationships to try to build that out in terms of a, a really great. And so I think certainly they can take that feedback in terms of that student choice and figure out how can they integrate that into that planning process. We do have uh, on that land as well. We have a joint powers agreement with uh, the city of Maple Grove, so we have some play fields on there and things as well. So um, it does uh, not limit it because there's certainly great opportunities with that partnership that we have. Um, but certainly that's uh, feedback that we can take back to our team and, and Margo as well to her team as we plan for the future. Yeah, it was just really cool seeing that these students make presentations to professional architects and city leaders sure. and it was just kind of cool. Um, so that leads me to my next question about, um, I think the outdoor learning space is um, quite beautiful, as a matter of fact, and um, I'm wondering if we can, as we go forward in doing additions um, or renovations or outdoor work, if we can um, put that as part of our, you know, going forward with science and STEM and all that. Yeah, it's a great, great feedback, uh, Director Mosquito Jones. In fact, the one of the uh, criteria that came forth from those study groups about a little over a year ago um, as part of next generation learning space was for those outdoor learning spaces. So as we do our audit across the, the district and as we look at opportunities for our facilities, we will certainly have that as one of the criteria that we're looking at for how can we do that. Um, certainly as we look at funding mechanisms, if there's ways that we can do that through things like our LTFM, but if there's other additions or new buildings, we will certainly integrate that in as well. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Director Simons. <clears throat> um, fantastic presentation, uh, really fun to see that come to life. And I know it's been a long time waiting and <laughs> I remember sitting in those meetings <laughs> and talking about just uh, the challenges there. Um, so it's good to see the relief coming. Um, uh, Ron, I appreciate kind of the test and learn. Uh, so as we put in some of these new features that don't exist um, elsewhere in the district that we're really learning about it, understanding not just that they look great, but the functionality and the usage um, so we can have really good insights as we think about um, building these things into the future. So I appreciated that. So that's all my questions. Thanks. Director Douglas. 
I do have some questions. Um, I, uh, first, I just want to say I'm really excited about this. It's been a lot of work, and we've received lots of updates over time, and um, I'm excited that we're like kind of like there, right, mm -hmm. to get started. I'm, I'm really excited about that, and it looks like it's going to be really beautiful. Um, but I do have some questions about the, um, specifically, the outdoor classroom, and that is kind of touching on what Director Mosqueda Jones was talking about is, you know, she was talking about more a little bit like, are the kids going to have a say? How are they going to be a part of this? My question is, uh, is that and how are we going to make sure this is maintained year after year? Where is the funding coming from that? Is that a site responsibility or is that district responsibility? Um, so that's one of my questions. I'll let you answer that first before I ask my other questions. Good evening, uh, um, Dale Carlstrom, Director of Facilities. When we were planning this, I think our, uh, our focus has been on how do we maintain a design that has uh, uh, features that make kids feel comfortable, but yet that we can manage on a, on a, on a basis where uh, the, the team at Rice Lake can, can get to most of it, but our grounds crew can maintain it. Uh, we look at uh, what sort of plantings are in there, what sort of... Uh, uh, pavement material and that sort of thing so that we're not um, having to either sink a lot of more money in the future or have it deteriorate. So that was our focus and that will continue to be our our charge when we go forward with this. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question I had about the outdoor learning spaces. On the map, I am not good at... Um, measurement on maps. So I am just curious about the outdoor classroom and its proximity to the other outdoor spaces and how the potential noise could, from those other outdoor spaces, could impact the learning in the outdoor classroom. Thank you. Great question. We had a lot of discussion on this exact topic. Um, and there were a lot of discussions, not only with Margo and her team, with Dale and his facilities team, but also, also with the city of um, Maple Grove. And um, when you're looking at this floor plan, um, you'll see the white boxes are the new additions, classroom addition, which is building, and gym addition, which is building, and sandwich right in between that is the outdoor classroom. And so there will be, there has been, some thought on how to create some different zones there and perhaps have some synergies with the kiddos um, away from the building for certain activities and closer to the building for others. You can see that there's kind of a triangle shaped piece there that um, calls out new soft play. That's your playground equipment. And so when you talk about synergies there, having all of that together so that if you've got some kids on the slides and the swings, you might have some kids over here um, playing jacks on the ground or having a conversation or working on a project at the same time so it's easy to um, uh, watch all of the kids at one time. Um, I think if I go back to this piece here, again, this is, this is the, the foundation with a lot of idea generation in this concept drawing here. So really when you open this building, there will be grass, there will be dirt, there will be pavement. Um, and a little differentiation, the rest is, the sky is the limit on how kids use this space. Perhaps in this diagram, what's closest to the building to avoid some distraction is perhaps the organic herb garden or a butterfly garden or something that's a little bit more fixed and the interactive is a little bit further away from the building to soften up some of that distraction. So um, I appreciate that clarification. I guess what I was picturing in my head when I was asking that question is like, mm -hmm. say I'm a classroom teacher and I bring my kids out there and we're doing mm -hmm. some kind of presentation or learning about something mm -hmm. that um, is relative to that space. Mm -hmm. And then we've got kids on the fields or on, you know in that area and they're playing soccer or something like that and it's really loud and rambunctious. How, how far away is that do we, have we, considered that that might be disruptive for the person who's teaching and the students who are trying to learn in that outdoor classroom space. And I, like I said, I'm not a good judge of space, so I don't have any idea like how many yards that is. 
So if you look at the outdoor classroom space, it's almost twice the width of, um, if you can imagine the existing gymnasium or an elementary school gymnasium, it's almost twice the width of that gymnasium, so it's a nice large space. Um, and then I guess to address your thoughts on the green fields where you can see kind of the football field layout, and then we've got another area called hard play, which is where your basketball hoops and probably those louder activities are going to be. Um, are a little bit further out from that area. The beauty of this design is that that outdoor classroom fits right into that little niche of sandwich between the new additions and the existing building. So it's almost like a three-sided classroom uh, to help contain some of that activity and to be able to divide it um, as you might see fit. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, is it all right, I have another question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I know on our virtual meetings we try to keep it short um, and then I had uh, one more question actually about the the previous slide to that not that one the one right before that oh never mind it wasn't is later it's the other way the common areas they look really beautiful and inviting and I was just wondering about natural lighting in that space mm -hmm. and I can't tell if that those windows on the back, if that's outside natural lighting coming in or if there's other natural lighting that we're not seeing in these images? That's a great question. Um, and in the essence of time, we kind of skipped over some of those details. But sure. um, to answer your question, when you're looking straight on in this view, the two sets of double windows, those are the existing classrooms that we're tapping into to be a part of this new addition. Okay. Um, so there's not a lot of natural light coming from that view. But on both sides where we've got those paired classrooms, um, the design committee had said we want large windows on the outside of that building and we want a lot of glass between the classroom and that breakout area. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine that fourth wall of the classroom, much like the pilot flex lab at Osseo Senior High, has glass that um, is right is in between the classroom and that breakout area. So even though it's inboard, that natural light will transmit all the way through. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah, I just, I would kind of echo what everyone said. It's really exciting, and I mean, I, you know, want to thank also our ECMAC um, committee because they really, you know, I remember, I think it was last year, they brought forth the recommendation, and then the Oversight Task Force really, kind of, Director Simons and I sat on that and um, learned a lot, you know, and um, so it's, it's just, it's so cool to see this happening and, and coming to fruition, and I think that um, I just can't wait for the celebration when it opens. So that will be really exciting. So congratulations and this is very exciting. Thank you. Um, the next presentation is learning model update with Superintendent McIntyre. All right, thank you. And I, I do want to echo appreciation for our guests tonight. Thank you for being here and, and Margo and your team for giving us some kind of boots on the ground insight on how this will be utilized in the building. So it's exciting to see it come to life a bit more every time we get learn a little bit more about it, so thank you. Right. Well, thank you, Chair Dawson Walton and, and board members. I just want to start with um, kind of what I say every time, but it's true again. Um, the appreciation I feel for the support of the board through the course of the school year and the challenges we keep getting in front of us and presented to us as we've moved in and out of learning models, and it's really um, tough work. and. Um, as I'll say later in the presentation to him, how grateful I am for our team and the hard work that goes into every little detail of um, each time we move in and out of different models and the information that keeps changing for us. The last couple weeks, the presentations that we've received, that you've received, uh, has given you updated and comprehensive perspective on the realities of the challenges that we're facing with student performance our racial achievement and opportunity gap, the gaps um, identified in other student groups, along with student mental health. This overall student well-being has been exacerbated by this pandemic, and we've seen that in the data uh, prior to COVID and now what COVID's continuing to um, cause to, for us to experience. And it, all of that, while just amazing heroic efforts of our staff, our teachers, our other staff members, and our school and district leaders um, as they continue to work day and night around the clock to, to do what we can to address that. And as Director Douglas mentioned earlier tonight, and as many of you have voiced in previous meetings and in many other conversations that we've been having, 
the information really clarifies the need to prioritize in-person learning as, as soon as we can safely do so, right? So we're at a point in time where we're gonna be able to take another step in, in that direction and meeting that need. With our elementary pre-K back in person last week and grades three through five starting next week, we're excited about that and um, a lot of work and effort has gone into that being successful. And we're again seeing firsthand that we know our children love being in school with their peers. We know our staff prefer in-person interactions that support that strong teacher-student connection and relationship. We know that many children learn better when they're in that physical classroom with their teachers. So that was just evident again as we're back in and to see it firsthand the last couple of weeks. You've also seen in my communications to stakeholders regarding the move to in-person learning as I, I discontinue to stress my belief that that will best meet those needs. Um, not just instructionally, but that mental health, social side, and our nutritional needs of our students as well. So our goal is to give that best experience in the safest environment we possibly can. So tonight I'm gonna to bring you an update on the latest information that keeps rolling in even by the hour. I was literally just putting this together minutes before we came in the room because it is continually fluid. Um, and although you may, you're not taking action tonight, I will provide you with a tentative plan that provides you the next steps to take action and, and do that very soon. We're really confident in the case rate data that we received today and the trending we're seeing in that. Um, and and what, we'll, what we believe strongly that we're gonna see in the short term in the future here to, that continues to improve to the point where we're gonna be able to move forward with bringing more students back safely at our middle school and high schools in compliance with MDE and MDH requirements. Um, along the way, though, we're gonna to continue to monitor the conditions, because they do change, and we've felt it, we've experienced it throughout the year, and um, we're gonna focus on getting students back and staff back to school safely. Um, so the, the tentative plan moving forward is also contingent on uh, getting support and approval from our MDE, MDH, and Hennepin County Regional Support Team, which we have scheduled again for Thursday, and then future board uh, approval. So I'm gonna walk through the information here with Joan's help. Uh, we're gonna jump right into our information. And uh, you've seen this slide time and time again, but I, I always think of there's someone seeing it for the first time, and it's important for our community to see our planning process. And so with this slide, it really lays out our readiness indicators as we continually evaluate whenever we look at a new learning model. So you can see we, we have a wide range of uh, items we continue to monitor. On the next slide, you can see our um, current status with our, our own ISD uh, safe learning plan levels, and we're in that level three area where we have partial in-person or we have in-person going at elementary with that distance learning currently at the secondary level with the distance learning academy also in place. And then on this next slide, uh, talking um, about these kind of the, the readiness indicators really can be bundled into three really primary uh, categories and considerations. And the um, heart of this is really looking at community impact with our county and city case rate data, our operational effectiveness and being able to deliver the learning model where we need to be in. And um, uh, honestly, really at the heart of it is our staffing um, in the absences and subs availability. And then the school safety element of district case rates for, for positive symptomatic and close contact cases. We've continued to do, on the next slide, we've continued to use our decision-making framework, looking at all those various data elements, developing recommendations, uh, consulting with those required state and county partners, along with our stakeholders, and then bringing that um, recommendation to you for a decision making and then turning around and communicating um, those decisions out uh, to our stakeholders again. So kind of to jump into some of the details here, um, you've seen this chart and I continue to kind of run a reference it because for our secondary students, this is still the original um, safe learning plan that we're required to follow for middle school and high school at this point. And to really kind of point out in this case, the key threshold for our conversation right now is that threshold of 30 um, and getting below 30 in uh, the county rate for that secondary hybrid learning model. And um, 
we know that our goal, our aim, is to get under 10 and get everybody back in person, and we're all hungry for that. But right now we're, we're trending in the right direction and, and now at a point of looking at um, information that's hitting that threshold of 30 again. So I just um, want to also stress we, we look closely at our city level data and all those uh, case rate information that you'll see in a minute from the district level. So the updated data we received today is on the far right over the last two week window and you can see We've really seen a dramatic um, decrease in the case rates the last few weeks. I, it wasn't that long ago we were looking at numbers in the 160s and 70s and 180s range, right? So now we're in a great space to be on the doorstep of that 30 threshold with the county rate today at 30.9. And that's a two week delay. So we know it's below that already as um, we do some forecasting. And I can tell you that um, that really opens the door for us to be more aggressive and moving more quickly towards uh, getting towards in-person learning in that hybrid model. The next slide just gives you an update on our city level data. So what you'll see here is, um, as from this week to last week, you see an eight point decrease in Brooklyn Park, a seven point decrease in Brooklyn Center, um, a nine, almost 10 point decrease in Maple Grove and over a 10 point decrease in Plymouth, getting us, um, uh, those are significant jumps from just a week ago. And we know that this, again, is a two-week delay in the, in the numbers. So again, we have a lot of confidence that this trend will continue as I've consulted with our state and county officials. And we'll see that, um, I'm very confident we're gonna see that case rate data go below 30 in the next two uh, reporting periods. And uh, as you'll hear me say later, that was one of the um, requirements we, we expected to have is get below that 30 mark uh, two weeks in a row. And so we can pretty confidently predict that's coming. That's next week and the week after. So we're basing our actions um, and my recommendation on that that um, calculated uh, uh, assessment of things. I did want to just quickly update you on our case rate information um, kind of covering the last week. So um, over the course of this past week, we had two more positive cases, so not a lot of additional positive cases. Uh, we had 19 over this past week's uh, data as I try to keep you up to date each twice a week actually. Um, when we looked at the next slide on symptomatic cases, um, this was where we saw an increase and that's really due to the fact we're back in person in the elementary and so we can see kids firsthand in a little different way than on the screen and um, have a little more connection with um, what might be happening and, and an increase where families might report things too. So we had an increase of 26 symptomatic cases, uh, 31 students and four staff. Again, back uh, really attributed to our in-person um, move. Um, on the Close contact, I'm sorry, yeah, the close contact cases here, um, we did see a jump here as well um, out, of, out of caution, and we had 97 cases this week um, up from where we had previously, so primarily with um, some students, and, and again, um, we're grateful for the reporting of that so we can really contact trace and make sure we're being safe with everyone um, when it comes to that. So as we look at the district when you take that kind of county perspective and use a similar metric, um, how many per, uh, so like the number's 30 in the broader community right now, for us as a school district with staff and students together, our number's 11. So it continues to improve right now and, and that's been a good sign. Now we'll see, you know, we're gonna keep watching this as we do more in-person learning, but we were well over 50 there um, in November and then we've been trending down mainly because we were in distance learning, but that, the status of this has really improved. Um, we always got to talk about staffing. I want you to kind of have a sense for this. And last week we were very fortunate to have a really good week with attendance and low numbers around um, quarantine in that first week. And I know some of our neighboring districts didn't have such a lucky first week like we did. We, we I think, did a really good job implementing our safety plans and really following those. Um, we did see a, a increase this week, as I shared with you earlier, um, but we have had a really um, good um, planning and effective um, implementation of our sub, uh, sub list and sub pool and, and all teacher absences for in-person learning that required a sub were filled. So we've been able to be successful with that. We did hire three additional continuous subs to strengthen that team and that will prove to be helpful as we move forward. We do have some, you know, we're watching closely the, those ESP positions in our setting three programs for special education and other support staff that don't always have subs or get subs 
and that, that could be a shortage area that we're just really watching closely um, if absences were to increase. We continue to reach out to substitutes and hire new daily subs. Uh, Laurel and our HR team have just been doing everything they possibly can to, to strengthen that group. And we've also connected with fall student teachers regarding their interest in um, continuous uh, subs and daily subbing as well. So just building as big a um, staff pool as we can. And then also we're pulling, uh, Laurel and her team are pulling daily reports of our absences to monitor those closely and who, what kind of staff might be out and what impact does that have on any given building. So some don't require subs, others do, and that really is a difference maker. So we're really watching not only how many, but who is it and how can we support the school if they're experiencing that. So on the next slide here, I wanted to talk a little bit about the consultation we had last week, and it now feels like by the time we talk about Thursday, the following Tuesday, it feels like a month ago, but uh, last week when we had our consultation with the um, regional support team, um, they're continuing to drive home the point that you know we're still working off those parameters of 10, 20, 30, and 50 as a starting point, and that um, at, you know as, last, as of last Thursday, our uh, city and county rates as well as they were declining and looking really good, they were at that point still, in their minds, too high for us to for them to give approval for moving into a secondary model. But we did have conversation about we we were starting to project out like this is trending the right direction and and let's keep thinking about that. But at la last Thursday's meeting, you know, we were still and kind of are at one of the higher um, cities in the county. If you look closely at our at our uh, data, they also reiterated the requirement of a two week rolling start and no more than three grade levels at a time in a, in a school. And then also we had some conversation and, and they gave us some guidance on the impact that's gonna happen with, we started our COVID testing program yes, uh, Monday on yesterday and um, that would be expanded as we bring more students in to the middle school and high school level along with the state, the very rapid moving parts to the state um, vaccine pilot program. And just for our community to know that we get that information Monday morning, we don't know what's coming, we don't know how many we're gonna get, and we, within a couple hours, turn that around and try to get people moving towards vaccine and to get um, almost 1,100 more this week was unexpected, but exciting um, because of 50 last week was nearly not enough for our size and that would have, you know, that just was um, challenging, but I think the infrastructure they're building will help when those larger volumes of vaccine continue to come in, that they'll be able to move that more quickly. So we basically, as you'll hear in a minute, um, or if I missed it earlier, those 1,100 will basically cover all of our elementary employees uh, from every um, position we have in our elementary schools. So um, we are very hopeful. We don't know. It's an unknown. It's out of our control that uh, what we'll get next week and beyond. But we're hopeful and we're on the ready. We're, we have, um, I have the deputy commissioner on speed dial when she calls at 9.30 on a Friday night. We're gonna get, we'll send 30 more people down right now if we can. So whenever those opportunities show up, we're gonna jump on it. Um, just a little bit more on the vaccine update here. Um, I really wanna say thank you to Laurel Anderson and her team. They've, they've really helped prioritize and have names on the ready. So when we get that call, we had an, an initial 50, 47 and we ended up having 214 opportunities because of those additional calls that we received. So just having that pre-ready and pre-prepared was significant. And so we'll see if we get more opportunities beyond what we were allocated this weekend, because it is a five day event at the Excel Energy Center, they changed locations. And um, what we do know is those um, tend to be offered outside of the duty day. But if, if that changes and we have a plan to be able to try to cover for folks so they can go get the vaccine. Um, but we're still waiting on some of those details and it's coming pretty rapidly. So those future opportunities are, are not known yet. Again, a little out of our control, but we're trying to be as prepared as we can when it comes to vaccine. And then the, this next slide is on our testing program, which we started yesterday. It's offered at all of our schools right now with in-person learning, either full in-person or hybrid every other Monday. And if it falls like on the 15th, which is a holiday, then we'll have it on Tuesday. So we, we don't miss that opportunity. We've had training delivered to our uh, testing staff and uh, tests are delivered to the lab the same day. We get those results back for employees within 24 to 48 hours and we're kind of in that window right now. Um, those results are confidential and not shared with anyone else. And really the purpose is to help us identify anyone who may be asymptomatic 
and not aware, especially if, if they you know, aren't experiencing symptoms, but could really help us mitigate any potential spread if people just weren't symptomatic. So we'll keep learning on that rollout and that model as we move forward. This was our first week with that testing program. So moving forward with um, what I'm recommending, based on kind of what we know today, I'm recommending a rolling start for our secondary uh, grade six through 12 starting on February 16th. So this is my tentative plan here that we have to continue to flush out a little bit more in the next couple days. But first uh, uh, rollout would, or first set of grades would start the 16th and then the next grade set of grades to complete the middle school and high school would um, come back March 1st. Again, we cannot do more than three grade levels at a time per building. So that works for our, our middle schools. It doesn't work for high school because uh, we have four grade levels. So we're uh, meeting with our secondary principal leaders tomorrow to kind of work out what makes the most sense and has the least impact on um, some of the classes we offer that are cross grade levels so that we can continue to deliver our curriculum in the best way possible. Um, this also includes, and I'm recommending intensive special education services starting also on February uh, 16th um, for, for all of our um, kind of center-based or setting three programs. And we're also considering the Osseo Area Learning Center as well, knowing that we have the three grade band limit to start. Um, we would uh, include really no school for secondary students on that February 12th, it's the Friday, which is usually a, a teacher prep day anyway, but we do some supports that day, but they need that day to prepare from a curricular standpoint. Remember for elementary, we needed more time because we were moving furniture and really preparing for full in-person learning but our secondary buildings are already set up for hybrid model that we, we moved out of in, in November. So we're just moving back in and many of those setups are, are still in place. But we just need a little time for our, our staff to be ready to go, knowing that that following Monday is also a holiday and then starting on the 16th of um, February. So this, this uh, plan will be pending, not only uh, um, approval by the board, which I'll get to in a minute, but um, I will take that final configuration that we develop tomorrow work that through our regional support team on Thursday. And then I'm recommending a special board meeting Friday morning at 7.30 so the board can vote on that, which can set in motion everything I've been talking about in addition to our transportation planning and rerouting that needs to happen. And then also um, food service and the getting our, our um, food service program up and running and ready to go by that time as well. So there's a, just a few points I wanna make as I, I wrap up here and then open up for your questions. Um, I, I, I say it every time like I did before, I, I know how much this affects families and, and students and our staff and the challenge of this continual moving in and out um, and reacting has been, has been tough and lots of frustration that many are feeling and I wish we didn't have to go through that experience. Um, although I'm excited to be moving back more towards in-person learning. We just see the impact on their social, academic and, and even nutritional well-being like we talked about earlier. And, like I stressed before, um, everything we've been seeing in our presentations recently just continues to reinforce the no notion that in-person learning is where we need to be as soon as we can get there. And uh, we're at another point in time to, to move in that direction. So um, with the dramatically improving case rate data, along with our testing program and the PPE precautions and you know the, the improvements in the vaccine um, really gives us that chance. I, I do want to take a moment to thank our um, and recognize the work of our middle school and high school principals and all the staff at those buildings because their hard work and preparation really needs to be acknowledged of what it's going to take to be ready in two weeks because uh, it's an aggressive um, timeline and we see the window of opportunity here, right? So, you know, there's a lot of hard work to be done in, through a transition like this back to hybrid and yet I have confidence, because I've seen it time and time before, that they will make it successful and they will do everything they can to, to meet that challenge because the collective, um, I think we just share the, we all see the needs of our students right in front of us and we need to meet those needs. So with that, I'll, I'll turn back to Chair Dawson Walton and, and facilitate for you to facilitate questions and comments. Okay. Thank you, I will start with Director Douglas. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I have a question about the two-week rolling start with no more than three grade levels at a time. Can you please explain why only three grade levels at a time are allowed in a particular building? Uh, yeah, the, the 
rationale I believe from the you know that I understand from the State Department is to minimize um, the number of um, bodies in the building. So when you think of like our pre-K through five buildings, um, starting with partial enrollment and getting success starting with those grade levels before bringing in the remainder of the building or the school um, grade level. So that's just at a came at a requirement from the state when we started with elementary and that requirement continues with middle school and high school. It fits for middle school. It's just a challenge for, for high school. Is there a potential to, um, when you're speaking with the regional support team, to get a variance for that so that all of our high school students can return to school at the same time? I don't believe so. I've pushed on that question a few times and they've been pretty steadfast on its three grade levels for high school. And some districts have gone out and talked about doing all four and now are, are backtracking because they don't have that support. So for us, um, we're going to talk through the couple different scenarios tomorrow and how we can start that. And I will lean on the experience of our elementary principals who have told me you know, when I was in the buildings that rolling starter has helped because they're putting in a lot of additional mitigation efforts. So to put that in place with part of the enrollment, get some experience, dial it in before they're fully back. Um, there's, there's been some appreciation of the ability to work that in and, and tweak it and fine tune it before everyone's back in. So um, I don't believe there's a variance opportunity based on my uh, conversation so far. Okay. Um, I don't believe that I have any further questions. I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, after the governor's um, announcement yesterday, I think that there was a lot of disappointment. Um, I think because of, the dis because of the announcement to send all of our elementary school kids back to school, um, and then hearing we were gonna have an announcement, I think there was a lot of anticipation that it was gonna be sending secondary kids back to school um, and disappointment that that's not what it was. Obviously, we're very excited about the education plan that's coming forward um, and the things that will be happening, but that doesn't help us with getting our kids back to school right now. I had um, strongly considered bringing forward a vote tonight to bring our kids back to school after extensive conversation with Superintendent Corey McIntyre and um, reviewing the information and with the understanding that we have a few things that we have to have in place, I am really looking forward to Friday being able to vote in support of bringing our kids back. Um, I would prefer if we could bring them all back and I understand that there are certain pieces that are beyond our control which is disappointing and frustrating but I believe that this is the best thing to do for our kids and I really appreciate the work that has gone into this to get our kids back to school um, as soon as possible. So I just wanted to say thank you for that work and commitment to bringing our kids back um, as soon as possible. So thank you. Director of Um So questions, I'll start with questions and then I'll add comments. Um, so when we look at some of the data here, especially considering the timing of the year, um, could we have some um, potentially like some baseline measures so that we can gauge absences um, relative to like what would it normally look like in a year during this time period so that they're put in some context so we know if this, this is a significant disruption to what we should normally expect or not. I think that'd be really helpful. Um, particularly from the, the staff side, I think like the students I'd be interesting, but I think the staff side, given that it's the operational question, would be helpful to be able to understand. Um, and then, again, uh, just to refresh my memory, on symptomatic cases, um, again, timing of the year, this, this is going to potentially be symptoms that cross over beyond COVID, um, but would be classified as a COVID potential situation when in another year it would be, you know, a, a, another fever and you just get sent home. So, um, it, it, so, so that's true. So it's, it, um, my question is, is that true, that it's, it, it's symptoms that could would otherwise be similar symptoms to cold or flu or other things, and they would go in this category. Yeah, we're, we're tracking anything that looks like flu-like yeah. symptoms. We're being very cautious per the MDH guidelines on that. Um, so yeah. that is part of it, and it really is a probably a part of the basis for the state recommending to families for mm -hmm. 
for um, young people ages 12 to 25 to get tested and get tested fairly regularly because that age group is just more outside their family pod and they're you know, and more engaged with other peers or um, activities and things like that that have been opened up again, right? So um, I'd like to echo that. That's a great recommendation for families to consider that. Um, and I can give you real quick on the on the staffing. We have started collecting that data again here now that we're back in person. The unique part of it is working through it because we're not the rate of absences is different with only part of our staff back. Right. Once sure, we're fully sure. back, we'll have a better apples to apples comparison to prior years. But right now we only have a portion back. But we're we can kind of work through that, and we're looking closely at how many, but what kinds of um, absences and in, in what areas of uh, school are impacted. So. Okay. We're back to charting that every day. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, and when we, so when we look on the first page, key indicators that inform decisions to change learning models, we've been very executionally focused um, in terms of the things that we're saying are the elements to inform it, and I think that was right at the time. However, you know, given the significant impact. Um, of how students are doing in the distance learning environment. I feel like we should be having bullet points on this front page to be talking about um, how well students are um, performing or achieving in the alternative in the different learning models um, or not being in the in-person model. Because to me, that would be, that, I mean, that to me, that is the central question, <laughs> um, the well-being of our students, their ability, their well-being not just academically, um, but from a mental health perspective too. And that's, that's gonna be my central consideration point. And then we as the decision makers and the adults need to be rallying around that to make it happen. So I understand that we're looking at it from how do we make it happen, but I think we need to put it more front and center that this is about the, ensuring the well-being and the success of our students. So I, I would like to see how we can incorporate that into these um, documents into, into our learning model considerations. Um, and I think we've heard that loud and clear from our families that their students need to be back in school. And so I really appreciate that um, the real-time um, thinking in this recommendation, especially as the uh, information over the past week has changed really quickly and in the right direction. So I really appreciate the speed with which um, this has been responsive to the changing conditions. So. I'm glad to see that I'm really looking forward to Friday's meeting so that we can have that vote. Um, my last comment would be that when we think about how, when I'm hearing about our meetings with um, MD and MDH, it feels very, um, I, it feels very directive. It doesn't really feel that there is a choice for us. Um, and even though we've spent all of this time making sure that we have the right criteria in place, um, that we're doing it for the benefit of our students, it really does feel um, quite one directional and very specific on numbers. Um, so, and I know that you're providing the feedback from our families, the needs, the pushback on what can we do. Um, I mean, I would really like to see an opt-in option, frankly. Um, we've spent a lot of time developing opt-out options, and I'd like to see the flexibility to have an opt-in option for teachers who want to be in the classroom more who for families who want their children to be in the classroom more um, but I know that's not within the state parameters right now so I appreciate that you're bringing all of that feedback that you're representing and reflecting the voice of our students and our families in those conversations but um, it you know it, I just want to acknowledge the fact that it's it's a bit one one directive <laughs> so I'm hopeful for the conversation that you have on Thursday I'm glad that we're thinking about the real-time information and that we're proactively now planning for these dates. So I look forward to Friday. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Director Mesquita Jones. Um, I am wondering if it's more helpful to talk about the, um, to continue concentrating on, um, to follow up on uh, Director Simon's um, request on um, staffing and absences, it's hard to compare those with other years because we have fewer subs than we usually do. And so I'm wondering if it's, if, um, if the data that is most useful is um, the rate of fill of those absence rather than how many people are gone and uh, compared to other years. Yeah, we, we've been, we have that information and we were, it was, it was actually, you know, we used to include it in the presentations when they were really long. Um, we've re 
we, you know, now we're back in person, we're tracking that daily because uh, it really does, it really does direct how we fill the subs and kind of the type of positions, especially which ones require a sub or which ones don't. So Laurel's been really closely monitoring that. And, um, if that's something you want to see on a regular basis, on a daily basis, we have it. I'm, I'm always thoughtful about how much I'm throwing at you. I gave you a lot last week. <laughs> it was a lot of to digest. No, the fact that, you know, we got our subs filled this week, yeah. you know, is, is um, good information for me. That tells me that um, with our kit, that we're um, prioritizing our kids and having um, the right amount of adults, um, you know, working with them. Um, I don't have any other questions. Um, I appreciate that um, you brought a good timeline for us to consider on Friday. I'm looking forward to the vote on Friday. I'm looking forward to the numbers to continue to go down um, so that we can make sure that we are um, doing what's right by our students academically, physically, social, emotionally, and mentally. Um, so I would echo our, the other uh, directors here about how um, I believe that there's been a lot of student centering, but it hasn't always been um, communicated as well as we would like. Thank you, Director Brooks. We have certainly heard the messages from the community um, and some of our educators loud and clear um, and consistently everyone is concerned about mental health. Um, so I'm appreciative of the recommendation that is to come before us on Friday. Um, and at this moment, I am supportive of it. I, I think the rolling start is, is important. I still have significant concerns as it relates to staffing. Um, the hope at this point is that we'll continue to get additional doses on a week by week basis. Um, and I'm hoping that with this rolling start, we can have enough of our educators vaccinated um, that it, it sort of aligns with, with those rolling start times. So um, I'm a little hesitant to rush everyone back at this point, um, especially seeing the success we've had as a, a larger community um, and taking this virus seriously so far. Um, and getting the numbers down to where they are currently. Um, so a couple questions that I have. Um, one of the, the big concerns that I have, especially with mental health, beyond not having the in-person support from uh, teachers and ESPs or the social support from peers, is the uncertainty um, and the bouncing around from model to model. Um, there is a new variant out there. Um, and I know if we rush too quickly without um, the vaccination, that could potentially have a significant impact on numbers. Um, I believe it said as early as March. And so um, I'm just wondering how you're sort of calculating that um, in these plans as well, um, just to keep consistency um, with our scholars if we're, send, if we're planning to send them back. Yeah, thank you for the question, and I'm glad you brought it up because I kind of missed talking about the variant in my notes here. So, um, what we we there's not a, a lot we know about it yet, other than some speculation from as we, we talk with our local uh, county and and state health um, officials. There's some ec expectation that we could see a peak in March, and it that could become the dominant version of the virus in March. They can't verify it. They don't know for sure. And so they really just said, be aware of that. And, and we know that if, if that were to come true, you know, we get, we got to have a plan and we have a model to, to respond to that. Um, and at the same time, they can't tell us it will happen. So we go with what we know. We go with what the current information tells us and let's take advantage of the opportunity to do some in-person learning and, and hopefully, to your point, stay there for the rest of the year and continue to build. So. That is one of those things out of our control, kind of like 
how many vaccine are we going to get the next few weeks? That's another out of our control element that we'll, we'll watch. And as that, if and when that changes, we'll have to respond to that. But um, our need, I kind of, you know, for me, the needs of our students um, right now are winning out. And if we can get those supports in person, academically, all the reasons we talked about, we need to move in that direction until we have more certainty on what maybe will or won't happen with the variant piece. So there's a, a lot of speculation, but not a lot of facts yet with it. Mm -hmm. And we'll just have to watch that closely and monitor what that may or may not do to to schools, right? Um, so no, we're daily <laughs> tracking and watching and talking about that on a regular basis. So I kind of hope that answers. I, I, I like what you said about, um, you know, getting 1,100 more, literally I thought it was a typo when we got the letter because I thought there's no way if we went from 47 to 1,100, but it was true. Maybe the 47 should have been a typo, but, um, you know, we hope that that kind of tread can continue. I know they targeted the Metro with those 15,000 extra doses and we got 1,100 of them and that's huge for, for our system. And the rolling start helps us kind of mirror the the time it takes to go through that vaccination process. So I wish I knew more about what's coming next week. If anyone can influence the, the governor or anyone else, please do, because uh, we've been trying. Um, and we probably will find out again Monday morning without much notice on what that'll look like. Um, but we'll, we'll, whatever we're given, we're gonna maximize it and we'll make it work. I, so I know it's only been a week, so I feel like it's, a little unfair to ask this question, but I was curious on the absences for teachers and ESPs if the current numbers um, have been consistent with the numbers we saw before um, we went into distance. Um, and this is more so coming out of concern for uh, the schools in Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center that have had higher case rates um, and had some significant staffing challenges. Um, prior to shutdown, just wondering how you're if you're keeping an extra eye on that and what those numbers are. So far, are significantly like. less. Like okay. we hit a tipping point in November where we had to close, like Birch Grove, we had to close a week ahead of the rest because we we just couldn't staff it. So um, the, right now, the numbers are much better. And we, you know, initially first week, like you said, but um, so far much much better. And, and part of that too, if you think of how big the community spread was in November and how, what the case rate numbers were like. We were really, you know, just what was going on around us was much more significant than what's happening now. So it's probably, you know, we know there's a relationship there of what's going on in our community and how it affects our staff too. So, so far we're in a much better place. We're kind of going day to day too in some ways too. We're watching that closely. So I appreciate you asking that because it was a, a different reality in November. Um, and then one more question, and sorry, I'm kind of bouncing around, so I'm going to go back. Um, how are we as a district or that regional support team communicating with the governor so that his office knows that <coughs> our secondary students are going back on certain dates and we really need some, back, some doses, you know, within that time frame, assuming we have them in the state? Um, can you talk about what that... Yeah. Communication is like that. Pushing on every lever I have. Um, I don't have the, the, the direct line to Governor Walsh, but I do have, um, <laughs> and I'm trying to get it, but um, uh, I pushed my way into that state group that also has um, some of our high level state commissioners on it. Heather Mueller, deputy commissioner, is on that, and I do text her almost daily because she does talk with the governor. She was on the press conference yesterday. She does have that direct connection, so she's my best ally right now, um, along with other members of our MDH and MDE team on that regional support group. And then um, there's some collective things that happen as well. So the area metro superintendents, there's about 40 of us meet every week with some common themes and we leverage that through AMSD because the, the governor does pay attention to all 40 of us as a collective, um, along with um, others that join us through our, you know, like uh, Deb Henton, our um, MASA representative, executive director is, is often in those meetings with either the commissioner, assistant commissioner or others. So I leverage who I know is in those conversations even if I can't be there myself. 
and then when I can push on to those things, I try to do that um, and just really stay plugged in. Um, because as you've seen, as I give you updates, it's changing all the time. It's really uh, a challenge sometimes. So um, know that we're, we're trying to do everything we can. And just the, it, one of the benefits of our size is people do listen because if we're, we're a bigger system, we're the fifth biggest. And so um, that's, you know, I got a call from Heather Mueller at 9.30 on Friday night saying, you know, if you're ready, can you send more staff down before 11? And, I, and you know, so we were ready to do that. Same with Saturday. I, I'm hoping that same kind of call comes this weekend so we can get even more down there. You know, mm -hmm. if we can turn 15 to 200. Let's turn 1,100 into 1,500, right? So we'll see. But hopefully it gives you some insight on what we're trying to do to keep our voice in the, in the room on, on, on decisions. Thank you. Um, and one more question. I'm sorry. Um, this if I keep one is talking, for... you'll just keep thinking of more questions. Right? <laughs> uh, this one is for our educators. Um, as we're planning for the return for secondary, a huge pain point right now is the face shields. Um, can you respond to your plans to address face shields for elementary right now and sort of mitigating any potential issues with all of our educators coming back for secondary? Yeah, first of all, we continue to get improved face shields for one, so that has helped. But I am still um, balancing the reality of um, the face shields are strongly recommended for requiring them. So it's not just strongly recommended, it's there's, the state is strongly rec recommended we require them. And we've not gone, I have not gone away from the public health recommendations. You know, we take those very seriously. One of the reasons they moved to in-person learning in elementary was the addition of face shields in the state, uh, the testing program, along with the epidemiology around zero to 10 year olds. So to not leverage one of those tools, I think puts us a bit at risk. And I don't wanna put any given teacher in a tough spot because they just, they chose not to use it and then something bad could happen and now the explanation is we well, didn't have your shield on. They are uncomfortable. I wore them for two days myself last week out in schools. There's an adjustment period clearly we're working with and how to get more, better quality ones as well. So I'm talking daily with our um, union representatives about just kind of monitoring this. We also know that compared to other districts, we have a higher uh, risk for, you know, we know this disproportionately affects our families and students and communities of color. And we have a more diverse school district, so we have been really thoughtful about this is one more tool to help us be safe. And to, to move away from that concerns me. And it's, it's early, so we're still kind of wrestling with can we improve this? Can we be a little more specific around situations where you can take that off? And then we've had nearly you know, 150 um, staff who've requested and, and need an accommodation to do something different. Mm -hmm. So working with those who it's really just in the way of instruction completely can we do something in, as an alternative without just throwing the whole thought out of, of a safety measure that was a basis for why we're back in person to, to begin with? So we're balancing all those competing things and, and we're five days in, right, or six days in now. Um, I'm, I'm gonna stay open to the conversation, continue to evaluate whether that's getting any better. Um, you know, as other things come into play like more vaccine and other things, maybe we'll see if there any new guidance gets uh, changed. I continue to, this theme is not unique to our district. <laughs> For many others, it's been a, a theme we've told the commissioner and assistant commissioner about um, so that they're aware this is a, a hardship. It's, we're, we're asking a lot of our staff to do this. Now, I've also talked to a number of staff who have said, I get it, I'll do it, because it means we can be back in person and I'm making it work. Um, so that's my honest kind of response where I'm at today. Um, and we'll continue to evaluate that and 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 see if, you know, I'm just reluctant to, to, to stop or make something optional that can prove to be pretty critical, especially back to your, your comment about the variant. That's one more reason we need to have every barrier we can to try to, to, try to protect um, everyone. So it's, it's a challenge, it's complex, right? Um, and it's, un, it's a new thing that we're not used to either. So we'll, we'll just kind of, I'll keep you posted on how we continue to work through that issue in partnership with our union leaders. Thank you. Um, I know, Thomas, you were really hitting it home with the questions <laughs> tonight, so I just want to let you go with it. Uh, I'll Director call you Grady. later. We'll talk more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Grady. 
I am so happy to see the vaccine pilot program focused on our elementary teachers. It sort of gives us the first glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel of this pandemic, and I hope that those vaccines keep coming as fast as possible. And while at the same time, we recognize that we don't have any control over that, and I appreciate the um, district and you said Laurel being really proactive and making sure that we're taking advantage of every single dose that's available to us. Um, I also appreciate the work the district's doing to meet the whole child's needs for their health and safety as well as social, emotional, and nutritional and academic needs. And while we all know that in-person learning is best for most students, nearly all students really want to be back in person, we also know as a system that we are responsible for their safety. And we really need to keep that in mind with this constantly evolving and changing virus. So once again, I just wanted to say, say thank you to you for all of the work that you're doing to consult with the experts that we need to rely on as we move through this pandemic and creating a thoughtful safety plan for our employees, our students, and our families. Yeah, Director Grady, you made me think of something I, I want to um, mention. We are planning a, a communication for families. Um, it might even go out yet tonight. So um, Barbara and I have been kind of working on that so we can continue to do our best to be transparent and communicate what our intentions are, knowing that we still have to act. You as a board have still have to act. But anytime we can give them advance notice for just family planning and, and other reasons, um, we're going to try to keep them informed. So. Um, especially with so many changing things, it's hard to keep everyone on the same page, right? So thank you for prompting that, <laughs> that and I appreciate your comments. You know, I don't have any questions. I just, but I, I really do want to say, and I know we're so fatigued, but there is a lot to balance. And I don't necessarily, you know, Superintendent McIntyre, I don't think any of us <laughs> envy your position. Um, I don't, you know, I think that um, you do, you know, push um, when needed, and you have a lot of, um, it's not only the state, but it's of course the, you know, our staff, um, our community, um, and our number one priority, which is our scholars, to ensure that they are, um, we're meeting their needs and fulfilling our mission, that we're, our promises to them. So um, I am, uh, I am pleased um, to see this recommendation before us. Um, getting our scholars back in school is the number one priority. I think I've said it before, but I, I think that <laughs> it's just so clear how important, you know, our education system is really the bedrock of our, of our society. And um, for all the reasons, you know, not just academics, but just the whole entire experience. And so um, I know that, um, that our secondary principals will rise to the, to this, um, uh, timeline and I um, and I just you know whatever we've said it before however we can be supportive um, in terms of getting back into the buildings and ensuring uh, everyone is safe that's what you know I know that we as a board really um, want to commit to so I'll I don't know if anybody else do you have another question director Douglas you're looking at um, no I will save my further questions or comments for later Okay, Dr. Um, I just wanted to kind of chime in on that face shield, and so I appreciate the tension there. I think um, as we consider the benefit to the wearer and the benefit to the student, I think that's just something to keep considering. If, um, and if a primary benefit is to the wearer, I, I feel like they should have a say in that for their own body and um, requirements. But I understand that there may be benefits to the to others around them. So um, just want to echo to continue to watch that and get that feedback and continue the decision-making process. So. Thank you. Director Mosqueda-Jones? Um, yeah, we talked a lot uh, tonight and at our work session um, about the mental health of our students and how that important that is. And although I firmly believe that having the social interaction with their peers will help in that area, it will not mitigate all of the mental health um, concerns. Um, just we know that incidences of suicide and mental health issues go up anytime there's an economic downturn or a big health concern or a natural disaster. Um, and that 
although we would love to say that we can fix it all by bringing um, kids to school, I'm wondering what other um, supports or collaborations we can have, particularly um, for our kids that just started um, coming back um, in elementary and are coming in, um, in a week for third through fifth and then our secondary. Well, the first thought I have is just the much stronger connection when we, when you, as our support staff, all the roles we have in our system have the opportunity to see and connect with kids directly on a daily basis and right. really be much more in tune to what their needs are. It, it's just harder, as you know, <laughs> you mm -hmm. live it yourself every day, that connection virtually. So getting us back in and, and really, um, it, it starts with that connection and relationship that we get to rebuild. I was talking to some uh, teachers today that this last week feels like the first week of September. It's all new routines. It's like the start of the school year with just all the things that you go through that first two, three weeks. So the very first thing is just making those connections and we're gonna be so much more aware and in tune of who we can, how we can support students. It, it's just been a big barrier as you heard from our team last at the work session on how to, how to be effective in this virtual space. And then as we continue to uh, you know, assess that, that'll probably drive, you know, what do we need to do differently as we get a little more experience with what this new in-person looks like and feels like with the additional mitigation things that are at play. So, I'll, you know, I think we're just in kind of, we need to get, we're in the process of transitioning in while we're assessing what else do we need to do as we learn more about kids' needs now that we see them in a more regular in-person basis, right? And how do we, how do we step up to that? So. Um, I, really, our teams are just trying to how do we get make those make those routines and connections back um, in person happen. Sure, and I appreciate that. And as you know, you and I have had many conversations on the importance of relationship and in, in mm -hmm. working with kids. But we also know that um, not all of our staff are um, have the expertise to provide therapy, um, and I'm worried about. Um, you know, whether we have enough resources to connect our kids to given that, it's probably gonna be at a greater rate than we normally mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that that's a priority for our administration and our um, school, um, our student services organization. I just um, wanna reiterate that um, we probably, might want to be looking at what other ways we can, you know, pump that up to, and if there's ways we can collaborate with other agencies. Yeah, I was just gonna say working with our community partners as well, yeah. um, beyond just our, our walls, but how do we wrap around with, with other supports um, in partnership too, because just thinking everything from all the different uh, roles we have in our system, trying to identify what the needs are as we start seeing students in a new light coming back. Sure. Is CARES dollars something that we can use for that? It is. And so if a city yep. or a county or um, that's a possibility that we could Yeah, and we're entering into that process now that we got the next round, prioritizing how to utilize those dollars, right? So that, that's that. happening right now. And the other thing I wanted to say is as a teacher to the other teachers in the district, when you get your link for your vaccine, uh, get on right away so you don't lose um, your spot and we don't um, lose that opportunity because um, I know that there were vaccines not um, claimed and that um, I just spent an hour and 15 minutes waiting to get my um, link. So get on it right away when you get that link and it's just you don't know when it's coming, it's gonna come. <laughs> Director Mosquito's joined uh, public service announcement. Yeah. <laughs> That's my public service announcement <laughs> for <laughs> teachers. I just, because you said you didn't know when those might be coming, just yeah. one came while we were in our meeting and um, for our OSEO staff as well, so. Yeah. Thank you, Ooh. Director Brooks. <laughs> um, I, so Superintendent McIntyre had some questions about after school programs for secondary students. Um, can we assume, I know the focus right now has been just 
getting kids back during the school day and focusing on academics and mental health. But um, I think having after school programs in place does have um, some significant community impact as well, um, particularly in some areas. So just can we assume that when we get back in person that a lot of those after school programs will resume? Um, remember for secondary, we're still really in that six foot social distancing piece because of hybrid, right? So those are requirements. So any activities that can successfully do that, and many are, are honestly happening still virtually. They have been uh, occurring virtually, whether it's activities with uh, musicals or other things, they found creative ways to keep that engagement going with those activities. Um, so the short answer is yes, as long as we have follow the, the health guidelines on groups, right? And, and how, how many in a group we can have and those, some of those requirements. So what I wrote down was uh, continue to inventory what are we able to deliver so you'd have an idea of what, what's still happening and um, which ones maybe have continued in a virtual arena because of the nature of the, of the activity or group or club, you know what I mean? So we'll, All right. and we'll then continue on with that. We know athletics are going, they've been going, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and I'll just um, just end with a comment, um, kind of echoing what uh, Director Dawson Walton already said. I just want to say thank you to um, you for um, being responsive and on top of it for always being available. Um, and then also just want to say thank you to our um, educators out there that are currently in the building, uh, those that are still in distance, to our families. Um, I just want to say great job to everyone uh, for getting us to this point um, and keep it up. So that's it. Thank you. Director Grady. Um, I appreciate your, your attention and the district's attention to mental health issues. Um, just like the achievement gap or the opportunity gap, that is also a pre-existing condition that occurred before the pandemic. And while you know it's clear that the pandemic has brought to the forefront more mental health issues, um, I really want to make sure that we keep looking at those issues in a way that is not just responsive to the pandemic, but also drills deeper into some of the mental health issues that our students were facing before this that COVID has overlaid. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, I think we be meeting on Friday, it sounds like. Yeah, so that'll be posted immediately. Okay. It likely will be under the um, auspice of an emergency meeting because of the uh, notification requirements. So we're in a pandemic. We've had many emergencies. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, all right, well, thank you so much, uh, Superintendent McIntyre. Our next agenda item is the consent agenda. Um, are there any items, board members, that you would like to remove for separate consideration? Okay. Oops. Uh, do you I am just wondering if we could take a bathroom a break. Bio break. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was just asking if we could just take Let's a minute, five minute just to use the bathroom and such. Okay. Thank you. The board is in recess for the board finish. is in recess. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, we are back from a short recess. Um, the next agenda item is a consent agenda. Board members, are there any items that you would like to have removed for separate consideration? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as printed? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, a motion um, by Director Douglas and seconded by Director Simons. Is there any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. The motion passes 6-0. So our first action item is a resolution to approve the sale of certificates of participation for the Rice Lake Elementary Edition. Mr. Meyer. All right, and good evening again, Chair Dawson Walton, Superintendent McIntyre, and school board members. As we discussed earlier this evening, in June of 2020, the school board approved a building addition to Rice Lake Elementary School to, to address overcapacity conditions at that school. The cost of the addition was projected to be $9 million and would be funded through our lease levy authority through the sale of certificates of participation. As you heard earlier this evening, the Rice Lake project has been progressing on schedule and on budget with an expected completion date of winter of 2021-22. This evening, administration is requesting the school board approval of the issuance of the certificates of participation, as well as the execution of all of the related documents. And here with us to, summary, to summarize the results of the bids for the certificates of participation that occurred today, which were very favorable for the district, is Jody Zespa, our senior mun municipal advisor for Ellers Public Finance Advisors. Ron, and good evening, everyone. I'm excited to be here tonight. It was fun to see the progress of the project and look at what will be financed with this um, funding. So first of all, um, we did hold off on issuing the certificates of participation so that we could issue them as bank qualified. So if you recall this last fall, we issued bonds for facilities maintenance projects and refunding opportunities, which saved your taxpayers some money. So that was really exciting. But if you issue over $10 million in a calendar year, you cannot issue the debt as bank qualified. And bank qualified status allows you to get lower interest rates. And so we held off on this financing so that we could issue it in the new calendar year. And boy, did it turn out to be a good plan. So you'll see um, tonight that um, the bids today came in um, with a low interest or a low true interest cost rate of 1.22%. So really fantastic. We've had really low rates over the last couple of weeks, and so we were excited to see that. And if you look at the notes on the first page of the report, you'll see that that rate is well under, we estimated 2.12% when we provided the pre-sale report to you at your December 15th meeting. We were thinking that sounded like a nice low rate, and we just came in significantly under that. So happy to see that. The results of that then is that the payments are going to be lower by $728,000 over the life of the issue and almost $50,000 each year. So really uh, exciting to see that. And we'll just go through a few pieces of information. I'll highlight some things and then you have the resolution before you tonight. So the first attachment to the sale day report is the bid tabulation. And you'll see Baird out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, along with lots of their close friends bid at a 1.23% rate. And then um, closely behind them was Northland out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, so local here at a 1.25%. So very close bidding. I think I mentioned before that we don't get quite as many bidders um, on certificates of participation, a little bit more limited in that part of the market as compared to general obligation debt. So we were anticipating getting fewer bids, but really glad to see these nice two low bids. The next couple of pages are updates then to the schedules that we provided to you with our pre-sale report in December. So the sources and uses schedule and importantly in that schedule you'll see the deposit of the construction fund at $9 million which is what is needed to finance the projects. And then the debt schedule and again um, these dollar amounts are significantly lower than what we were expecting. We did um, restructure the principal payments a little bit so that we could match up that first payment with what you already levied. 
So you had levied $737,000 for taxes payable in 21. That was approved in December, so we thought we might as well save a little bit more interest and match up that payment as close as possible to the levy. And so then the remaining payments are reduced down to about $660,000. Um, then you did go through the rating process again. And so you'll see the um, two rating reports that were issued for you this fall. So the first one is a press release and much of this information is the same as when you issued your facilities maintenance and uh, refinancing bonds last fall. Um, they do um, assign a rating uh, one notch down from your regular general obligation debt rating for lease purchase financing because there is a required annual appropriation clause by state law. So that just adds a little bit more risk to, uh, from an investor perspective and that's why the rating agency assigns uh, a one notch down um, rating to this type of debt. And then finally, the detailed credit opinion starts on attachments page uh, nine and again, much of this information is the same as what was issued for you in the fall with the exception that um, now all of your audited 2020 data is included. At that time, the, the data was preliminary and now that it's been approved by you, that is all included in the detailed credit opinion. And then the uh, award resolution that you have bef before you tonight was drafted by Dorsey and Whitney, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have related to the sale day report the excellent results you received, um, and or the resolution. Thank you, Ron and Jody. Um, is there a motion to approve the resolution to approve the sale of certificates of participation for the Rice Lake Elementary Edition? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? I second. Okay, so it was, is there any discussion? Thank you, Jody, so much for saving us money. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it was really exciting to see the results come in. We were worried. We just saw two bidders signed up, and we thought, oh, gosh. But you know what? All it takes is one really, really good bid, and we got two really, really good bids. So happy to see those results. Great. Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. All right, the motion passes 6-0. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you, you once again for the opportunity to serve the district. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great. All right, the next action item is approval of an agreement with Ideal Energies to install solar array panels at six buildings as part of the Solar Rewards Incentive Program. Mr. Meyer. All right, thank you again, Chair Dawson Walton, Superintendent McIntyre and board members. In December of 2019, the school board approved a partnership with Ideal Energies for the construction and installation of solar panels at 12 of our buildings in our school district. Through the Solar Rewards Program, this partnership will provide long-term utility cost savings without any capital outlay for the initial investment. Over the course of the first 20 years of operation, the solar panels are expected to save the district over $1.8 million. And over the life expectancy of the equipment, it is expected to save over $4.5 million. So tonight, we are requesting approval of entering into uh, an additional agreement with Ideal Energies to install solar array panels on an additional six buildings as part of the Solar Rewards Program. And I do want to point out uh, that this program is a little bit different because it, uh, the six buildings do not qualify for that low income incentive that the previous 12 did. So it is a little bit different, but there is still a significant financial benefit to the school district. And so to review the current program and also the potential opportunity for our school district, we have with us uh, this evening, Braden Solom, who is the Vice President of Development at Ideal Energies. And I just want to thank him as well as Jody Sespa uh, with the final, uh, the last action item for sticking around with us so, uh, so long this evening. So with that, I will welcome Braden to the podium. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for having me. It has been just a little over a year, I guess a year and one month uh, since uh, I was last here speaking to you guys, um, talking about our first 12 projects. Um, so I've just 
I've got kind of a short, um, just a couple slides here to kind of walk you through what we're looking at now. Um, so we did install the 12 systems that we talked about a year ago. Um, you can see that those were turned on pretty quickly, some of them in April, some of them in May. I think we had one in July um, that got turned on. Those participated in that solar awards um, low income incentive. So that's a, uh, a legislatively funded program that helps XL Energy meet their requirements under their, um, like they've got their requirements to have a certain amount of clean energy coming from solar by 2025. So this helps them meet a small portion of that carve out. Um, and so that's why this program exists in the first place. Um, so we participated in it. They did add on this. You guys were in the first year of the low income incentive. So that schools that had 50% or more free and reduced lunches qualified for an additional grant. So technically it was two grants. Um, there was a time sensitive nature on that. So we focused on those 12 first. Um, they were 40 kilowatt systems. So 39.655 uh, kilowatt systems. Since we last spoke, there's been a slight change to that program um, due to some legislative work that our company did along with our lobbyists um, to get this program switched to be a little bit larger in system size. So now we're allowed to go up to 53.6 kilowatt set, uh, system. So just a little bit bigger, just a little more savings um, that the school sees. We have six additional projects. So these ones didn't qualify for low income, but they qualify for just the solar awards program, which is a standard program that we do um, across public buildings all over the state. Um, you can see that, that we're, these aren't very large systems. We're not talking about um, taking over a huge proportion of energy savings at each school. Um, but for what they are and for the grant money that you get, it is the best deal you can have for solar currently in the state. So what this looks like um, is the district owns the arrays day one. So just like we did before, you guys are fee title owners to the array. You make no upfront payments for the systems. Your only obligation is to purchase the energy produced um, by the array, and we set it up to be a 20% discount um, to the value of that energy for 16 years. Um, during that entire uh, period, we are operating and maintaining the systems on behalf of the district, um, and the solar panels carry a 25-year production warranty. Just an additional piece on this, um, at the request of Ron, we did an energy audit of the systems that we installed so far. This was like late fall, I think. Um, and we found that all the systems are producing at 104% of the uh, projected energy that we had modeled. Um, we set those expectations up right away because we know that we want to win when we partner with a district like yourselves. Um, so yeah, we're, we're sitting in a position of success and what we'd like to do is uh, possibly do some more solar with you guys. Um, so this is one of these systems, just so you can see a cash flow. Uh, we set it up to be a 20% savings. So the value of the energy coming off one of these arrays in the first year is $5,561. Since you are fee title owner of the system and you're renting it back to us, we pay $50 in rent. It's a nominal amount. That's your total revenue. You guys have your energy payment that you make, uh, which is 80% of your savings. Um, then you have a slight insurance expense, total up, and then do the math and across, you save about $1,000 a year for each system. But I do wanna point out, if you can look at year 16 to year 17, um, following year 16, the agreement terminates um, and you have all the remaining energy that that system produces for the life of it is free. Um, so it's extremely similar to the projects we've already done. Um, just more possibility for it. If you look at all six projects that we're proposing today, um, over the lifetime of the systems, we'd be looking at a, a district savings of $2.181 million. Um, you can see at year 16, again, just to kind of get that, once you jump from no, no longer having any energy payments, you go from saving 10,000 a year to 56,000 a year immediately. Um, that's the total of my presentation. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we're just requesting to possibly do some more with you guys. Thank you. Oh, and he's got another slide. Don't okay. Yeah. I'm just going to uh, talk a, a little bit just about some next steps um, if the board does approve the partnership with Ideal Energies. Um, a couple of things. First of all, we will work with uh, Tim Palmatier 
as well as outside counsel just to go through uh, the contract process just like we did the last time because of the caveats of the little bit, uh, the, the changes from the, that low income um, to no longer having that as part of it. We'll make sure that all of that is in line. And then also working with our roof contractor uh, from an engineering perspective uh, with Dale Carlstrom and, and their team as well, just to make sure that there's no uh, issues or concerns with putting them on those six sites. Um, and then also, uh, I would just say that Ideal Energies, uh, uh, Braden talked about these six projects. They have proposed and brought to our attention some additional uh, solar opportunities that are a little bit more extensive that could uh, potentially create some more significant savings for the school district that we are currently vetting right now as well to look at the possibilities for that. If that's something that we feel is, uh, could be a benefit to the district and makes sense from uh, those roofs that we would put it on, we would bring that to the board in a work session at a future date to go in more depth about it. So with that, I'll turn it back to Chair Dawson Malton. All right, thank you so much. Um, is there a motion to approve the agreement with Ideal Energies to install solar array panels at six buildings as part of the Solar Rewards Incentive Program? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, motion by Director Douglas, seconded by Ms. Uh, Director Mosquita Jones. Somebody. Is there any discussion? I, oh, go ahead. Well, maybe we'll start down the line again. Director Douglas. I do not have any questions, thank you. Director Sandman. Um, so remind me, um, so we'll do the roof review. Um, it, we would not put them on a roof, like you can't replace a roof under it, right? Like it's, roof's gotta be ready to go. I'm trying to remember from the last time we had this conversation. Yeah, so typically what we look at is uh, from the structural integrity and the age of the roof. Mm -hmm. Because um, obviously we don't want to put one up there and then if we have to replace a roof in a couple of years, if there is an expense to taking it down mm -hmm. during that process. Uh, the last time around and what, uh, something that we would look at doing as well is negotiating um, a set price for removal of that in case we do have an issue on one of our roofs where we have to remove it. So it's not some unknown cost. Um, so that, that is those six roofs have already, we've already went through that process. Ideal has worked with Tremco our roofing company to, to really gauge which roofs make sense from that age and structural perspective. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Uh, Director Mosqueda Jones. Um, I remember last year at the presentation that there were opportunities for students to um, have, for there to be some curriculum around it. I'm guessing because of COVID, we haven't ha been able to do a whole lot, but um, has there been been any at all yet or we're it's still? A, it's a great question. So Ideal Energies did complete uh, the curriculum and they did deliver that to our department of or division of uh, teaching and learning. And so um, I, I do believe, I, I'm not sure if it's actually being utilized right now, again, because of the back and forth shifts, but it is something certainly that they've delivered and they um, will continue to work with our a teaching and learning team uh, for integration into curriculum if, again, if there's an interest from our uh, building level. Thank you. Director Brooks. Um, along the same lines, um, I have a smaller question. Um, Maple Grove Senior High, I know they have a uh, green club. Um, I'm just wondering if we have thought about getting this information over to them and um, having them be a part of this process as well just knowing that that directly aligns with um, what their goals are. I, I, I don't know specifically if we have uh, engaged the Green Club, but I will certainly pass that information on to our teaching and learning team. I can tell you that they have also reached out to me and they're very interested in working with district leaders. Yep. So it's a great opportunity to um, capitalize on some brilliance of youth. Sounds great. Thank uh, you. Anything else? Okay, Director Grady. Oh, I just concurred. They're very excited. About <laughs> 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 They've been reaching out. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I would just say that I'm. It's really exciting. I know we've been talking about it over the last year, so um, it, which seems like a really long time ago. So, <laughs> so um, to come back, and I, I think it's really forward thinking, and I, um, I really, um, I'm supportive of it. So. We can take it a vote. Um, all in favor um, to approve the agreement, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you.
Final action item of the night is to um, is the recommendation to accept gifts to the district totaling $102,185.49. Is there a motion to accept gifts to the district? Total? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Motion by Director Douglas, seconded by Director Simon. Is there any discussion? I think we all can just say thank you. I think it's one of the hum most humbling parts of our agenda. To, uh, it looks like from our faith communities to our firefighters and all in between individuals. So we thank you very much. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion passes 6-0. And our last agenda item is adjournment. We have a motion to adjourn at 9.18 p.m. So moved. All right, and we have a second. Second. All right, motion by Director Douglas, second by Director Brooks. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, motion passes 6-0. The meeting is adjourned at 9.18 p.m. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone.